Hello there, we're going to get started. Thanks so much for coming to the, our inaugural Creative Entrepreneurship Workshop. I'm Butch Van, the Faculty Director of the Brown Arts Initiative. And I'm Danny Warshe. I'm the Executive Director of the Jonathan M. Nelson Center for Entrepreneurship. Yeah, so this is really the beginning of a really cool and I think fruitful collaboration between the arts and entrepreneurship. It's really a natural. And uh, so I just want to tell you just like in two sentences what the Brown Arts Initiative it is. The Brown Arts Initiative kicked off this actually last summer and I'm brand new starting as of July in this sort of faculty director position for this initiative. The idea is that it's a consortium of all the arts on campus, the departments and programs to bring together resources, raise the profile of the arts at Brown and make connections like this kind of thing we're doing today, like to connect across the campus with other disciplines. And I, I want to just stress that it's about the arts on campus everyone that's not just people in the departments that are doing arts within the arts departments it's the whole entire arts ecosystem here at Brown and if Butch you are new in your position I'm really new in my position because uh, I've been on this job for I think 70 days and uh, I hope it's relevant to say that on the very first day of my tenure in this position I reached out to Butch. Butch yeah, and right. I knew each other a little bit in the planning process for the new Center for Entrepreneurship. And I do think it was the very first meeting yeah, it was, yeah, it was in amazing. my tenure. I met with you downstairs and I said, I don't quite know what we should do together, but let's brainstorm. And by the end of that meeting, we had envisioned this. And this will be one of many such kinds of workshops and programs that the Brown Arts Initiative and the Center for Entrepreneurship will be undertaking collaboratively. Yeah, so stay tuned for other workshops like this. So we have a lot to do today, so I want to get started. But before we do, I want to thank several people who helped make this workshop possible. And I want to start with Liz Malone, who did a huge amount of uh, logistical work to get this happening. Nakira Del Sesto, Sophia Lacava Bohannon, Greg Picard, and Sean Tavares, and all the other people at the Granau Center who are hosting this today. And I'm going to thank, uh, we'll do this individually as we invite them up, but our collection of world-class speakers, and that includes uh, Panos Panay, w when we were thinking about who should kick this off on everybody's mind was Panos. Panos comes from the Berklee School of Music and we're really thrilled that he's with us today. Uh, Stefan Alexander uh, was somebody who breathlessly and enthusiastically reached out to me in those first few days of my tenure and I think s we spent roughly two and a half hours together in the Blue Room uh, imagining what we might do together uh, on the top of the list was this kind of collaboration so we're really thrilled to have Stefan with us. Charlie Cannon is a world-class um, everything you know he'll, he will tell you it's a long list of accomplishments and uh, that includes being head of the industrial design department at RISD and uh, R Charlie and I collaborate on a variety of things Charlie's been a guest in my entrepreneurial process class here at Brown and we're thrilled that you were uh, willing to be with us today and then there's a team of folks from a startup locally called your heaven those uh, three f it, three folks sitting over there that's Arvid uh, Steve and Prachi and you're going to be wowed by what they show you at the very end of our program in terms of uh, a really great example of the theme of today which is arts or in this case music technology and entrepreneurship so we're really excited that you're with us today and thank you to all of our speakers who so graciously uh, decided to commit part of their Sunday afternoon to being with us this afternoon yeah, so I'll start by introducing Panos and then we'll get uh, going here. So our first speaker, Panos Pane, is the founding managing director of Berkeley's Institute for Creative Entrepreneurship, or that's the Berkeley ICE, as well as a passionate entrepreneur and active startup mentor in the creative media space. As the founder of Sonic Bids, he created the leading platform for bands to book gigs and market themselves online, building a subscriber network of 550,000 bands and 35,000 promoters from more than 100 countries. He led the company as CEO for 13 years, from its inception until after its successful acquisition by Backstage LLC and a deal backed by Guggenheim Partners. He writes about startups and entrepreneurship for blogs and publications such as Huffington Post, Forbes, The Wall Street Journal, and Fast Company, and he has been named to Inc. Com Magazine's Inc. 500, Fast Company's Fast 50, Bostino's 50 on Fire, and Boston Business Journal's 40 Under 40. Pane has delivered guest lectures at universities such as MIT, the Wharton School of University of Pennsylvania, and Brown, as well as at industry events including South by Southwest, Marche International de Disque et de l'Edition Musicale, uh, and TEDx. He serves on a number of boards, and he is probably the coolest guy in this whole uh, world of arts entrepreneurship. So won't you please join me in welcoming Panos. Pane.
thank you so much for having me, and thanks for that super cool intro. It makes me seem more important than I am. Um, and I guess the first thing that any entrepreneur has to do is figure out how to get their PowerPoint set up. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, okay, cool. <laughs> first thing worked. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for being here on a Sunday. I know how precious Sundays are. Um, and I'm thrilled to be um, at this event. It exemplifies so much of our worldview at Berkeley, which is that interesting things happen when you create what we like to call creative collisions. You put a bunch of people together in rooms that normally they would have never been in together and kind of step back and, and see what happens. And I'm hoping that this is what you'll do um, today. And I'm also thrilled to just see Brown really accelerating its efforts in the space. Um, we've done a number of things with Brown over the years, including a joint high school um, summer program that actually is called Creative Entrepreneurship. Um, so it, it, you guys, I, I have a, a special soft spot for, for Brown, hence the drive here on a, on a Sunday, on the only day that I have with my family. But I, um, cool. So um, I'll tell you a bit about my life story. And then I'll um, give you an overview of the methodology that we've developed at Berkeley over the last three years around what it means to think and, and act entrepreneurially, uh, a, a, word, a word that I still can't quite pronounce or spell. Okay, um, uh, who is that? What is that movie? Little, little things that you don't expect can change your life. But my life changed in 1985 when I was 13 years old, uh, growing up in Cyprus, which is where I'm from. And I know there's another Panos here from Cyprus. Where are you? Cool. Um, <laughs> it is a common name. I have another nine cousins called Panos. Um, so anyway, um, I think this is my first lesson in entrepreneurialism, that the most amazing things happen to you when you least expect them, uh, when you don't necessarily design them. But for me, my life changed when I saw Marty McFly plug in a guitar and blow himself to smithereens in that you know, first scene of Back to the Future. That made me want to pick up the guitar um, and uh, set me down a, a, a sort of this lifelong ambition of being a rock star, which I never quite managed. Uh, but that led me to applying to go to school here. And um, probably you've experienced this as well at Brown, but um, if you come from a small country and you go to a bigger place, um, all of a sudden you realize that you're probably not as good as you, as you thought you are. And, and for me, going to Berkeley, I remember that first day I thought, what the hell am I doing here? Um, it, it scared the shit out of me trying to be a professional guitarist among a school of <laughs> about a thousand other amazing guitarists. But um, my second lesson in entrepreneurship is course correct. Um, so being um, at Berkeley, I started realizing that maybe my path didn't lie in being a performer, uh, but I ended up doing uh, music business. I was part of the first ever graduating class for music business management. Um, and then after I graduated school, I became a talent agent for this guy and a bunch of others. Anybody knows who this person is? Uh, okay. Uh, besides being a, a bunch of frizzy-haired guys, uh, that is Pat Metheny. Um, and I booked a number of jazz artists uh, over the years. Um, I, I was a talent agent for about six years. Right after school, I became in charge of the international division of this company. I booked a lot of my idols, people like Sonny Rollins and Pat Metheny and Brandon Marsalis, Chick Corea, Leonard Cohen, Patti LaBelle. Um, but through that experience of, uh, of being in a company, um, I kind of began to notice the different inefficiencies that existed in the traditional agenting model. If you don't know what an agent does, um, it's pretty simple. They're basically an intermediary between an artist and somebody who's looking to hire that artist. Um, so through my experience uh, there, I started thinking, well, gee, we have this informal rule that unless you're making $3,000 a night, um, we can't take you on as a client. But certainly, um, none of the people that I had graduated with from Berkeley were making that kind of money. So I thought, where the hell does everybody else go? Um, and, and this is in the prehistoric era of 1999. Um, but I thought, what if 
it was possible to create an online marketplace that made it easy for any band on the planet to connect with anybody who was looking to book or license their music. And again, I'm speaking very quickly and I'm trying to uh, put a life of about 13 years in about 1.3 minutes. Um, but that's what led me to starting a company called Sonic Bids, uh, which I started out of my apartment in, in 2000. Um, I, I grew it over the next 13 years until I sold it uh, almost exactly four, four years ago. Um, but uh, Sonic Bids is a matchmaking site for bands and people who book uh, music. Right now it probably has over 700,000 bands from around the world that, that use it. Um, but through that I experienced all the ups and downs of, of being an entrepreneur. Um, bootstrapping a business, building it with my own, you know, with, my, with a lot of credit card debt. Um, and, and doing all the scary stuff that you should not be doing at home. Um, raising venture capital money at some point seven years after I started the company uh, and leading it all the way through, through an acquisition. But maybe of all the stuff that we've done, the things that I'm the proudest of is ultimately this, that since we started the company, over 1.2 million gigs around the world have taken place. And, and this is a lesson for anybody here that um, Sometimes your actions can have a disproportionately wide effect. Sonic Biz was not Facebook. It's not a large company it, like a Google or a Microsoft. It's a relatively small company. When I sold it, we were about 85 people. Uh, but you can have impact on a worldwide basis. And to this day, I go to many places where people will come up to me and be like, dude, I'm, I'm a member or I was a member. Or, you know, I'm at bands from Iceland who got to do tours in China, and I met female Iranian DJs who got to go to Europe, and I met a metal band fronted by a woman from Egypt that got to come to America and play. And to me, this is why we do what we do, because as creators, as entrepreneurs, and to me, it's the same word. An entrepreneur is a creator in the same way that a musician is, is a creator. We do what we do because at the end of the day, we want to leave our little mark on this world. And this is what I'm sure every single one of you aspires to do. Um, in my 13 years, I learned a few things, and I'm going to try and move, again, pretty quickly through this. But um, there is, I'm going to swear a bit, there's a lot of bullshit about what it means to be an entrepreneur, uh, especially in an era where we glorify this term and we think that entrepreneurship is all about, it's all about a bunch of hooded kids in Silicon Valley coding yet another boring app. Um, please, please, please do not aspire to just do apps. There are so many bigger things in this world than hailing taxi cabs, okay? Uh, so many more important things. Art being one of them, and it needs you. But follow your passion, okay? Don't start a business or don't go into a career because you think you're going to make a lot of money. Do something that really reflects who you are and your deep, deepest, most intentions. Um, just like the second part, it's not about your idea. Ideas are meaningless. I get pitched, I don't even know, 15, 20 ideas a day. Uh, I don't care. I care who the person is and what motivates them because this is what gets you through all the ups and downs of being an entrepreneur. And again, if you are an artist, you are an entrepreneur, okay? You're not going to get a job. You're going to make a job. That's what being an entrepreneur is. You create your future. Um, business plans are important, but for God's sakes, that's not the only thing you need, okay? Uh, as a very famous war general called von Clausewitz said, the first uh, casualty of war is the battle plan. Um, and though I hate using war analogies when it comes to art or entrepreneurship or business because they're overstated, um, uh, I will tell you that flexibility and improvisation and thinking nimbly is more important than some well-researched plan. Um, this is something that um, the, the next one, uh, the founder of a company called Newberry Comics told me. Um, anybody knows who no Newberry Comics is? Okay, cool. Mike Dries is one of the coolest guys you'll ever meet, but Mike told me, dude, if you're the smartest guy on your board, you're getting really bad advice. And I think when you're younger, when we're younger, we all want to be the smartest people around. And if you're the leader of something, you think that you're a leader because you just know better than everybody else. You know, 
if, if you make that mistake, you will surround yourself with a bunch of people that are just telling you yes, 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 and you're all going to go over that cliff together. Um, who's seen the movie The Godfather? Okay, what's the one phrase that sticks out? Okay. The, 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 uh, the, <laughs> the, one, the one for me is that, it, you know, it's, it's not personal, it's business, right? Um, a bunch of baloney. Business is about relationships. Everybody has a superpower. Uh, I think mine is relationships. I genuinely like people. I genuinely like to get to know people. Um, and if there's something that's gotten me through my career, um, it, it's been the ability to hopefully forge meaningful relationships. And this means that it's not about transactions. It's about getting to know and getting to understand people. So whether it's your customers, whether it's your partners, whether it's your colleagues, it doesn't matter. Your investors, they're all human beings and they're all motivated by things that all of us human beings are motivated by. So don't ever mistake that somehow business is a series of transactions. Business is a, um, is a series of really good relationships. Always keep upgrading your skills. And the last thing that I'll say when it comes to um, my little 13 lessons or whatever this is here, um, just have a good time. You know, your, your creators, your artists, it's just so important that you enjoy what you're doing. And I'm not saying you're not going to experience ups and downs. You will. But you have to love what you're doing. And, and, and um, you have to genuinely ask yourself, am I enjoying what I'm doing? Because that becomes infectious. That's what gets people to join you. In, in a crazy journey. Um, and being in a rock band or being an entrepreneur is, is about the two craziest things you can possibly imagine. So if you're doing both, <laughs> good luck. Um, so after I sold my company, um, the president of, of Berkeley, who is a good friend of mine, um, uh, I was chair of the advisory board there for a long time, and he was on my board uh, of directors. Um, approaching about this concept of starting an institute at Berkeley, which we called Institute for Creative Entrepreneurship, or Berkeley ICE. Um, and, you know, it, I, admittedly, I paused. I'm like, what can you possibly teach this stuff? Can you possibly teach entrepreneurship? What does it mean? Do a bunch of creative kids care about entrepreneurialism? Um, and and I, I struggled a lot with it up until I realized, well, if we, if we believe that we can coach people into thinking more creatively, being more improvisationally, I improvisational. If, if we fundamentally believe that we can um, sort of take something as amorphous as, as, as jazz and coach it, then why not entrepreneurialism? Um, and in some ways, that actually began to inform the approach that we took at Berkeley, which is less so about borrowing what every other business school was doing there, but really tapping into our own unique strengths as an institution to develop these instincts that I think are critical for anybody that aspires to go into the creative industries. Um, who's been to Boston? Okay, good. You guys are, are, are below a certain age, so you will have no idea what this building is, but does anybody over a certain age, or does anybody recognize this building? Okay, this is, today this is TJ Maxx. Before, it was Best Buy. And before that, it was Virgin Records. All right, before that, it was actually Tower Records, indeed. That tells you the history of the music business in the last 15 years. But this was once the world's biggest record shop, okay? Um, four stories, pretty cool. Um, for those of you who haven't been inside a record shop, this was once a record shop. Um, now, that's a record shop. Um, OK, some of you are probably music majors here. Anybody recognizes these two folks? No? OK, that's, uh, that's Lieber and Stroller, OK? They are the guys who wrote Jailhouse Rock and a bunch of cool songs. But that was, this is how people used to once compose music. You know, two guys or gals or a guy and a gal <laughs> getting together in a room and making music. Well, today you make music this way, right? Who's a creator? Everybody's a creator nowadays. Um, hell, machines are creators. Anybody knows what this machine is? 
This is Watson. Watson actually composed a song that up until recently was number three in the Billboard charts, no joke, uh, with a guy called Alex the Kid. You can go and Google it. Uh, and you can figure out how it was able to basically read a bunch of New York Times headlines over the last 10 years and ingest a bunch of information from the most edited entries on Wikipedia and a bunch of Supreme Court rulings and then go and ingest a bunch of data from Twitter and Facebook and figure out what people were thinking and feeling about these things. And then he collaborated with a songwriter and created a pretty cool song. So this concept of creation is changing all the time. This is an industry that's changing all the time. When I was a kid, this is how we enjoyed music. No, that's not me. I don't know who that is, but I thought it was a cool photo. Now we get music through wearables, the virtual reality, intelligent thermostats will be able to read our mood soon enough and, and, and play an amazing playlist or heck compose a song right on the spot based on all the stuff that we actually like. Um, intelligent assistants, that's Google Home, or even intelligent, intelligent cars. So this is the challenge that anybody goes, that's going into this industry has. How do you focus on creating the future rather than protecting the past. So if this doesn't call for entrepreneurial thinking, I don't know what does, right? Everything is converging and this is the opportunity that you guys have. This is the most fun time ever. You know, uh, scaremongering and demagoguing aside, okay? Uh, and I just became an American citizen because I'm voting in this election and you can guess who I'm voting for. Um, and it's not the demagogue and the anti-immigrant. Um, but, um, you know, we live in an amazing time. And we live in a time when you all have the ability to go out there and create a future of what the creative industries will be like and what is the next multi-billion dollar platform for entertainment and art and music based on what I've just shown you. But how do we create this future? And at Berkeley, we're saying, how do we get our students to expand their view of what is possible with a music degree? It's not just about the prescribed paths of being a performer, being a sound designer, being a music producer, or even a music business kid. But we want them to tap into their innermost, innermost creativity to be able to build careers in a way that's meaningful to them. So I'm gonna show you um, a couple of minutes of a video about the institute, just so I give you some context and then we'll take it from there. As an institution, we owe it to our graduates to give them not just the tools to be amazing performers or producers or sound designers, we also need to give them the corresponding tools to develop successful careers in a way that they define it. The Institute for Creative Entrepreneurship, which we call ICE, is an effort to encourage our students to both start enterprises, but also go beyond that and see themselves as artists, musicians, as an entrepreneur. For me, entrepreneurship is fundamentally a creative act. You have something inside of you that you want to express, and there is endless parallels between what makes a successful musician that I believe are directly applicable to entrepreneurship because we fundamentally believe that innovation comes through collaboration. I reached out to Ken Zola at MIT. Whether it's about understanding improvisation, how to listen to an audience, how to respond to adversity, these are all things that I try to get my engineers to do, and these are things that musicians are doing over and over and over again. We seek to create different experiences for our young students. Everything from understanding the process of co-creation or understanding the idea of prototyping by exposing them to cutting edge thinkers like IDEO. We also bring music producers and songwriters and chairs of our different departments here at Berkeley. Your challenge is to start figuring out what your purpose is and finding other people that can help you to arrive at that purpose. We're talking to the most incredible, influential, smartest people that we've ever seen. We're getting the most unbelievable opportunities. It makes me want to work my butt off. Part of what makes Berkeley special is that we have amazingly creative people that have come from all parts of the world, and within them they carry this unique voice that we want to help them express and hone and refine so they can go out there and develop their career in whichever way they choose and hopefully make a difference in the world. And that's what we aim to do with Berkeley Ice.
mentioned earlier, um, when I thought a lot about my journey um, from effectively somebody who went to a music school throughout being a, a business person entrepreneur, I started realizing that my education was not independent of what I ended up doing and how I ended up doing what I did. That my musicianship never really left me in, in many ways. And, and I always thought, for example, of my company as a band. It's such a cliche to say, but the way that I recruited people, um, the way that we motivated people, the way that we approached management, you know, in terms of effectively creating a space where people could come and express themselves was a lot based on my own experience um, as a musician. So from the beginning, I thought, rather than trying to inject something foreign into the school, what if we build on its existing strengths? And I think this is a lesson for anybody who is looking to do anything. Build, build on your own strengths and what you're already doing well. But um, I mean, before I show you the next couple of slides, like, you know, what, what do you think musicians and entrepreneurs have in common? Name anything. Do they have anything in common? Patience. What else? Mm -hmm. So being sensitive to the environment. Yeah. Persistence. Exactly. You have to, people do join you and see a particular vision you have. Yeah. Creativity. That's correct. Yeah. A, a, a disregard for, you know, for, for the accepted wisdom. Anything else? Yeah. Always improving, always working on yourself. I mean, we can go on and on. I'll show you a few. But I would say discipline, <laughs> you know? It, it, people tend to not think of the amazing discipline that it takes when you're a creative being to be good at what you're, what you're doing. But, um, okay, which is this band? Who is this band? Uh, believe it or not, I've shown this picture to a bunch of 15-year-olds who had no idea who it was. Um, but, you know, uh, if you're a musician, it's impossible to be successful unless you become a good, a good listener, unless you're observant of your, of your environment. As we just discussed, the same thing when you're, when you're an entrepreneur. You have to be sensitive to the changes that are happening around you and adjust accordingly. Um, actually, more 15-year-olds knew who this band was than the other one, which is cool. Uh, <laughs> um, if you're an entrepreneur, you're out there and you're collaborating. If you're a musician, you can't make music, really, unless you create something as cool as Butch has. But I mean, other than that, <laughs> you have to go out there and create music with other, with other people. And, and even, even with, with that, you still have to make music with other people. But as we were just talking about, it's, it's about getting a group of people of different disciplines to come together and create something together, something that is digested in its entirety, if you will, together. That's what entrepreneurs and musicians do. Um, anybody knows who this is? I like this crowd. That is Dizzy. Okay. Uh, you all know about Dizzy's trumpet. Most people don't know that Dizzy's signature look and sound actually was a result of an accident um, with his trumpet when he was a kid. But isn't it interesting how sometimes something completely unexpected can lead you down a particular path, and that path becomes your, your signature. Uh, Peter Drucker, anybody knows who Peter Drucker is? Okay, I guess I'm not talking at a business school, which is cool, <laughs> but uh, Peter Drucker is a very famous management thinker and says, always look for unexpected success, right? Always build, sometimes we tend to ignore um, things if we didn't design them, and we just say, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, but unexpected success is so critical, and improvising and thinking nimbly and being quick on your feet is critical. Um, who are the two guys in this picture? Yes, okay. Again, I keep loving this, this crowd. I, I've shown this to many audiences. I'm always interested, you know, who knows what and, and why. But um, what's interesting about this picture? Anybody know? Or what's different about it? 
based on who these two folks are. They're both soloists. Yeah, I mean, Miles, who's arguably a bigger star, and more people know who Mar Miles Davis is worldwide than Charlie, right? He's playing sideman in this particular, in, in Charlie's band. Charlie was a star. But this concept of knowing when, in, in, in jazz, we call it comping, right? Knowing when to lead and when to give the stage to somebody else is a critical part of being a musician, critical part of, of, of being an entrepreneur. Greatest performance of all time. Anybody knows what this is? It's, it's Queen at Wembley at Live Aid, actually. July 13, 1985. Check it out. I usually show this performance next to Steve Jobs' unveiling of the iPhone in my classes. And I have students talk about what similarities they see. But if you're a musician, you know how to present. Don't, don't tell me you're shy. You get up on a stage every day and you talk to an audience. You get them to buy into that reality, right? And that's called selling. If people see what you see, you just sold them. And that's what creative people do really well. They speak to people's hearts, not to minds. So regardless of what you're trying to do here, always focus on people's hearts. It's not what you say, it's what people think you're saying. That's, that's important. Um, we talked about discipline and practice for the music buffs there. Anybody knows who the uh, white guy is in that picture? That is Gil Evans. Okay, yes. Um, practice, practice, practice. If you're going to speak publicly, for God's sakes, you know, at Berkeley we had something on Friday night. We had a whole week around social entrepreneurship and the kids were coming to present and it was clear to me that they never practiced. And I'm like, would you go and play anywhere without having practice? No. So why on earth are we giving you three minutes to talk and you've never practiced if you can deliver your message in three minutes or less? So whatever you do, make sure you've done it so many times that's second nature to you. Super cool guy, who's that? Jimmy Page. What's weird about this picture, Jimmy Page? <laughs> there's only one neck. <laughs> there's, yeah, there's probably a lot of other weird things. Um, well, again, experimentation is just so important and failure. You know, I like to say that in music, we always look at failure as a means to learning, right? But in our lives, we never think of it that way. We tend to think of it as something final or something scary. But there's not a musician or an artist or a creator out there who doesn't approach failure as a road to learning. I mean, I have young three-year-old twins, and how do they learn, right? How, they, how do they learn language? They repeat, and they're not afraid of making a mistake. That's how they learn, right? And we don't judge them for making a mistake. What can we, how can we apply that in our journeys and our careers? Uh, I'll close with these couple of things. Um, this is not necessarily my saying, but I used to say the music business particularly used to be about a hustler and a hipster. It used to be about a Colonel Tom Parker and an Elvis Presley or a Peter Grant and Led Zeppelin or Brian Epstein and the Beatles, right? Today you need a third role in that, and that's a hacker. You need to combine these three skills of technology, business, and creativity, whether within one of you or, or all of you, but it's absolutely critical. It's a reason why tech companies are hiring creatives. There's a reason why Apple is hiring people from Burberry and Yves Saint Laurent, right? And, and Google is hiring all kinds of artists because we understand that the future, which I showed a bit earlier, is based on our ability to have an equal dose of these three sensibilities. And I will leave you with this one thing from a very famous American. And that's about it. If you have any questions, I think I have three minutes. Happy to answer any. Yes. <laughs> uh, God, that's another lecture altogether. Um, I mean, my, my biggest advice is, yes, don't hang out with other creative people. <laughs> you know, seriously, get different disciplines together. 
Uh, I don't believe that you can manufacture things. I think that you can create conditions for things. So in many ways, at, w w at, the, at Berkeley, what we're doing with the Institute is saying, what's the best way for us to create these conditions? And maybe the one thing that I know is creating, as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, ways for people that normally wouldn't have met to come to come together and just kind of get out of the way. So that, hence, the joint classes with MIT, joint classes with, with IDEO. I mentioned we have a, a joint summer high school program with Brown. But how do we create more of that? How do we take people outside of the element where they're comfortable? Creativity is not about being comfortable. It's about pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone. Um, creativity is about being able to interact with people ho who um, see the world differently than you. Um, and inspiration. Inspiration often not from the things that we think make us creative, but those unexpected things. You know, so how do you put yourself in those, in those conditions? Yeah. It's another lecture. Uh, so I'll try and be quick. Um, God, many. Many of them had to do with people. Um, just... Um, Hiring wrong people, but it wasn't their problem. I mean, it was my fault. Um, not always managing people the right, the right way. Uh, I think we, in business, we talk a lot about business plan design and organizational design, and we don't really think about all the people challenges that you will encounter as a human being. And, and you know, people are your best asset, but people can also weigh you down if you, if you don't approach them the right the right way. So in, you know, again, without having a lot of time, I would say be aware of the challenges that um, are involved in selecting the right team of people. It's, it's, not, it's not easy. Okay, I think we're exactly on, on time. Thank you very much. We're going to transition seamlessly. I, I know people are getting refreshments, which is perfectly fine. Uh, I mentioned before in my earlier remarks that one of the very first people who breathlessly reached out to me in my first days as executive director of the Nelson Center for Entrepreneurship was Stefan Alexander. And we spent, I think, over two hours together in the Blue Room. And one of the thoughts on his mind was something like this, where we could gather in just the way that Panos mentioned, where we have a diversity of interests represented in the room, and we get together, and there's a little bit of structure, but we see what happens. I guess uh, an appropriate metaphor for music, where we have a light score, and then we have a lot of improvisation. Uh, Stefan, I think, himself represents that kind of diversity, even in his own expertise. Uh, the book that he wrote, The Jazz of Physics, I think is evidence of that alone. Stefan is a world-class uh, theoretical physicist, and it was partly in that context that you reached out to me and said, oh, let's do some things related to entrepreneurship and how it can influence my research in theoretical physics. And I thought, wow, that's such a brown thing. I'm not even sure I know what that means, but <laughs> we'll, we'll figure it out together. And uh, that is a hallmark, I think, of our mission in the Nelson Center for Entrepreneurship. Our mission is making entrepreneurship an essential part of the Brown experience. And I think that alone is good evidence of that. 
his expertise in music and how it overlays uh, physics is also, I think, a good indication of uh, Stefan's perfect fit at Brown. We're also intending to work together on the work that Stefan does with the Presidential Scholars Program here at Brown, the STEM focus piece of that. We're going to infuse entrepreneurship into that part of the curriculum. Uh, Stefan is here in a couple of different ways, partly as a musician and partly to share with us uh, some really inspirational words about uh, his work in both music and in physics. It's a real pleasure to introduce you and welcome you here today. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thanks so much. This guy is awesome. That's what I'm going to say about it. This guy is a man right here. Go, Danny. Um, so, um, you know, when you ever get a, a, you know, a big shot like this and you send an email, you don't know if it's going to respond. He responded and we had coffee together. I was hoping that you, we would go somewhere more fancy, like Blue State. <laughs> we went ahead of and um, so anyway, I don't have much time. Um, and this is uncomfortable. Um, but um, so what I'm going to do is um, there's a little bit of, of a surprise. We actually have a legend, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in some circles, some people consider to be the best bassist alive, Melvin Gibbs, who will be joining pretty soon, and a local Providence jazz artist as well, um, because, you know, a big part is entrepreneurial thing, and definitely something that Danny has always been about is engaging our community. Um, and, you know, Providence, when I was a grad student here um, at AS220, the Fringe used to play here with Hal Crook. I mean, some of the greatest mu jazz musicians on planet Earth used to play right down there. And every Wednesday night, a whole bunch of us used to go down and listen to George Garzon and Jerry Berganzi and Hal Crook Google these people. And they used to come and hang out, and it was such a big inspiration. And I think we're, uh, we Providence and Brown, you know, we're, we're so interconnected. And I think it's very important to engage our local artists. Um, and I know that's what Danny, Danny's big time about as well. Um, so anyway, I'm going to kind of do two things. I'm going to try to do two things. And I'm going to spend less of my time talking and, um, and basically play some music with these guys, OK? Because Melvin came all the way up from Brooklyn to play. Um, so what I'm going to try to do is to kind of tell you a little bit about how engaging in the arts and in music and engaging genuinely with artists and musicians throughout my trajectory as a scientist, how that was a secret weapon that allowed me to solve problems in physics, okay? Um, so I'm not gonna like sit around and like be, let me just brag and say that um, in 2001, I solved a major problem that infused string theory with quantum cosmology. I was the first person to do it and that did not come from solving a bunch of equations and hiding behind a cubby hole or something. It came from hanging out with musicians. And so, so I really do believe in what I'm saying because I'm a living example of it. And one of the things I hope to continue engaging at Brown as a physics professor is, is working with students and faculty and, and, um, and entrepreneurial center to sort of like, you know, um, continue to investigate that and amplify that energy. So what I'm gonna do is kind of give a quick kind of like, you know, similar to what Panos did, it's like a quick overview of how that happened and what were the influences there, what were the challenges. And then say some interesting, I'm going to give you some interesting, actually, a physics lesson. I'm going to tell you the most powerful idea in all of physics and actually in engineering. And then show you how that works to make our universe function. Because I do cosmology, right? So, and, then, and then I'm going to end with some music. So my life story in a lot of ways has been about attention. Should I be a nerd or should I be a cool musician? It was, <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I'm a nerd, all right? But you know, I grew up in the Bronx and it was not cool to be a nerd, okay? Um, that, that was just my situation. Um, there were lots of peer pressure for, at that time, to be a, a hip hop artist because I grew up in the 80s in the Bronx. And so there was this underlying tension throughout my entire life, it still exists today, of, you know, Musician versus a scientist. So what I did was, I basically hid those two sides of myself from people. So at nighttime, I'd play music. At the daytime, I would sneak in my office and, play and pretend I'm a scientist. And these two worlds never spoke to each other. And, um, but there were some, some sort of interesting things that were very helpful. So do you guys recognize who this gentleman is? This is Rakim. Even Eminem said he's the greatest MC of all time. Okay. 
So, Rock Him, this is one of the signs of um, his first um, debut album. That's what I'm saying. I drop, who, can, who can rhyme? Who's, who wants to say this? Somebody say this. I'm going to pick somebody. I'm going to pick you. <laughs> say it out loud. That's dope. So Rakim made it okay for a young guy, a kid like me, who was secretly a nerd and was interested, had an inquisitive mind, to be a scientist. And that's the importance, you know, when, we, when, you, when you hear idiots like, um, wait, this is not being recorded. I, I take that away. This guy's really cool. But there's a particular <laughs> very famous hip-hop artist that was asked about the um, sort of what was it called, the Black Lives Matter thing, and this guy is an icon that everybody listens to, and he goes, I don't care about that, I don't even identify with that, you know, and I'm just a rich da-da-da, I'm a rich N. You know, it's like, young people listen to this guy, you know, I mean, we're not all perfect, right, but when you're, you know, so Rakim made it okay to be a scientist, so a 13-year-old kid, and that was important. So that's another, that's an example of an artist, right, of a musician that inspired a young scientist to be. This was another person that inspired me. So many people, we know that this is probably <laughs> the smartest homo sapien of all time. And trust me, if you disagree, come spend some time with me and I'll, I'll explain why. <laughs> all right? Um, so pretty much all of our technology is based on his discovery of quantum mechanics, um, the photoelectric effect, the ability of light to make electrons move. But he was really famous for this theory of general relativity, which now our GPS satellite systems use. So Albert Einstein, many people don't know, also was a civil rights activist. He was friends with Paul Robeson for over 22 years. He was friends, he, um, W.B. Du Bois, he helped W.B. Um, avoid federal prison because he was a peace activist. So he's an example of a scientist citizen, even though many people don't know him in the public sphere or whatever. And as a young person, you know, music is a very sociological thing. We, we, music is about identity too, right? And I grew up with hip hop, I grew up with jazz music, and that, that, that music is, you know, so to know that Albert Einstein, who was a scientist, was friends with Langston Hughes, who was a poet, was important to me. Because it showed me that if I were to become a scientist, it's not about navel gazing and being disconnected from the world, but being connected to the world. So that was important. And the other icon was John Coltrane. So my book is about this diagram that he drew near the end of his life. He was trying to understand the code of the universe through music. You know, when you go post Coltrane, post, post a love supreme. And this diagram happened because after a lot of investigation that I did and talking to musicians that knew him, the guy that you, um, Sonny Rollins, that you rep represented, um, his biggest idol was Albert Einstein. Everything he could get his hands on about Albert Einstein, he read. So here's an example of an iconic musician, right, that kind of stared away from what a lot of musicians were not thinking and doing. He was reading Albert Einstein. So where am I, go where am I going with here? I'm, I'm going with is sometimes, you know, we think what's in fashion and what's cool. You know, there was a time entrepreneurship wasn't cool, it wasn't fashionable, now it is. Sometimes, you know, doing that thing that's scary, which is sometimes you don't really fit in, that might be the thing. That might be the next big thing. That's grammatically incorrect what I just said there. That's why I'm a physicist. So fast forward, um, you know, after PhD at Brown, I went to Imperial College in London, and what happened was I became friends with this gentleman up here. Do you recognize that guy up there? Anybody? Brian Eno, all right. And if you don't recognize him, those two people were the people whose career he founded, pretty much. He produced David Bowie and um, Bono, amongst tons of other people. And Brian actually, we're going to bring him here with the help of Danny's money. <laughs> no, sorry. But he did agree to eventually come to Brown and hang out with you guys. Um, but Brian, the reason why he was such an inspiration was during that time when I was struggling as a scientist and the, all these people who were so much smarter, like in Europe, all these guys, the German cats, you know, they, they calculate much better than we could. And my training at Brown was quite kind of like, you know, soft. <laughs> I'm, this was a, the way I, f I felt about myself. But, so as a result, I didn't really hang out with the physicists a lot. 
on my way to work, I used to go hang out with Brian. And one day, right, I saw Brian playing with um, these, little, these little squares on a gigantic computer screen. He didn't know I was in the studio. And um, I was like, this guy's lost it. He's supposed to be making like fancy music and he's playing video games f like Hubert, like from back in the days. Well, it turns out that that's actually a cellular automata. And this was the year 2000. He was playing with, with mathematics, okay, that even mathematicians at the time, it, you know, it was stuff that was, that was advanced even for mathematicians and computer scientists. He was playing with this because that eventually became something known as generative art. That painting is a result of these cellular automata, these simple rules that assign complex behavior from simple systems, complex emergent behavior. And um, cellular automata is actually used in research in quantum gravity, for example. And that's why Brian Eno was hanging out with people like me and Lee Smolin. He wanted to hang out with people that worked on the fundamental structure of space and time itself. Because I, I used to wonder, why the heck does Brian Eno want to hang out with a nerd like me? But that's why. And this became known as something that he sold to Apple, called a million and one painting, some weird thing like this. But this became generative art. Every painting is completely unique, right? Um, and now he is, um, I think, in the Coldplay album that he produced, um, If I Could Rule the World, he used some of this generative stuff to, to, to do the treatments for the sound effects in that, that album. Um, so, and so that, that made it okay. See, that was important. Because at that time, I was struggling with this dichotomy of should I hide my music life from my science life, my music relationships from my scientific relationships? Are they going to think that I'm, I'm out of it and dumb and not, um, yeah, that, that was the issue, right? These social pressures, like it or not, not fitting in. Brian made it okay, because I was like, wait a minute. If Brian Eno, of all people who has had four decades of ma making hits, could actually w just like freely import ideas from science, and he didn't care what other people thought, maybe I should just do the same thing. So what I started to do then was to embrace it. And how did I embrace that? Um, one of the direct ways I embraced it was to reteach my intuition, was to f liberate myself from all the sort of rote mathematical reasoning that we're taught to think in the sciences and basically start hearing science. And the way I did that, and one of the things that I will do here at Brown is to develop a new course for all Brown students, okay, that basically teaches physics purely in terms of sound perception. And hopefully with Professor Butch here, we can do this together through the Entrepreneurial Center. And I want to call the course maybe the, you know, the the jazz of music, oh no, the music of physics or something like that, the music of science or something, the jazz of science, that's what it is. Um, or maybe you guys can help us come up with a good title for the course, okay? <laughs> All right, we'll have a, like a tally or something like that, a lottery. But what I wanna do, how much time do I have? Because I wanna make sure we can play some music. Uh, but oh, phew, boy, okay. <laughs> I wanna just give you a sense of what I'm, how, how this might work, right? What you see in here, on the left-hand side here, I'm gonna basically teach you the most important concept of all of science, this, right? This is something known as, as a fancy name, the Fourier transform, all right? It underlies all of signal processing, pretty much what goes on all these machines. Professor Butch can agree with that. Basically, what we're looking at here, on the le upper left-hand corner, is the addition of two waves that are, very, that are identical, and obviously what you see is a larger wave that's gotten from that. What we're looking at down there is two identical ways, but one is displaced, such that what's positive is negative, and what's negative is positive. And if I add those two waves up, I get zero. That is the essential idea behind the Fourier transform, because what it says, it says, you can take, let's go to example B now. If I now take, if I add up three simple waves, those waves are all simple in the sense that they're exactly periodic, if I add, right, so what that all, all that really means is that I could label to each of those waves a number, an integer, one, two, three, corresponding to the number of cycles. So that's like a, think of that as your alphabet. You have words, and I can decompose complicated words into an alphabet. So what does that mean? By using this concept that I can, by adding waves together, I can amplify them or subtract them, 
if I add in these three waves, for example, I could create a complex wave. So imagine an alien life form sends you a signal from SETI. This is exactly what SETI does. They get very complicated signal. That's the one down there. You can do the inverse. You can decompose it into, a vo into an alphabet of waves that you understand. This is the essential idea of the Fourier transform. And this is how music works, exactly how sounds work. And this is how the universe works. Because it turns out that everything, the fundamental form of matter, at its fundamental basic building blocks, there's a unity. And these things are called fields. You're familiar with magnetic fields and electric fields. These things also undergo vibration as well. So it turns out the universe does have a musical character, and I spend basically 300 pages of my book kind of walking everybody through that. Uh, that's just an example of how instruments work. I don't have time to talk about that. But what I want to say is that what I'm saying is nothing new. From the very birth of astronomy itself, the first time an equation was associated with motion, astrophysical objects, the first time in the 1600s, after 2,000 years of humanity trying to understand this, going back to the Greeks, was when Kepler figured out his law of elliptical motion. So Kepler has three equations that associates the velocity, the distance, and the area swept out in an elliptical orbit of all the planets in our solar system. And this also works also when we try to discover new planets out there, all right, now in the order of two billion per galaxy. And how did Kepler come to this? He ascribed, because he didn't have equations, he wrote down musical notes for the velocity of all the planets. And from that, he did his, his equation. He used musical reasoning, okay, his musical intuition. And so what, this program is, um, is to just do what was already natural at the very birth of ast astronomy. I don't have time for this, but this is a large scale picture of the structure in our universe. If I focus in that, you see this cosmic web, what is that web? If I zoom in that area and I zoom, continue zooming, every dot you see there is a galaxy like our own Milky Way galaxy, which comprises about 500 billion stars, which our sun is one of those stars. And so if I zoom back in, what we're looking at basically is seven billion light years of an interconnected cosmic web. And in my book, I basically show that 14 billion years, when this was initiated, it was a sound vibration. So the same, so when I started to realize that, I started to basically play more music and try to just use musical feeling, intuition, again, not thinking, right? to basically give me more of an intuition. Because I realized that my, mus my, my musical friends were also playing in the opposite way. And we're, we're in such exciting times where th this conversation and our university, our administration, is really supporting this. So we're at a very uh, um, exciting time in Brown's history where this is happening as we speak. This is a baby picture of the universe. And, this, um, and I don't have time to talk about how this might be connected to quantum physics, but you know, I'm embarrassed in Holly 551, drop by any time and I'll tell you what this picture means. I ain't going nowhere. I just thought this is a fun picture. You got a hippie like vibrating with his aura. And this is a particle and an antiparticle annihilating and you see the vibrational pattern there too. It's kind of cool. Um, I'm not gonna, I think, um, our previous speaker spoke about the importance of mistakes and innovation. This is a picture at Mitten's Playhouse where the drumming style for bebop jazz, you know, when, when, um, when they play off beat, that was a mistake that Max Roach had and it stuck. <laughs> um, a lot of the, these, these music, people like Charlie Parker, they used to hang out and play swing music, which was the, the road stuff, and then they used to go um, up to Harlem at 125th at Mitten's Playhouse, and they used to in um, experiment. And part of that experiment pr experimentation process was making mistakes and embracing making mistakes. And being an acrobat, knowing how to fall when you make a mistake. Right? That's actually kind of what I'm going to demonstrate today when we're playing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think I'm pretty much done. Thank you for having me. And you know the fun. <laughs> oh. Thank you. Um, so now we got, again, a legend. I mean, I don't deserve to be playing with this guy, but he, I, he, I call him a, a, a musical philosopher, 
And I, th I think you guys know each other. What, what a small world. Huh? Um, so the legendary Melvin Gibbs. Melvin played with every defunct, because uh, everybody. Who didn't you not play with, man? <laughs> Parliament. He didn't play with Einstein. Um, but he comes up here to play with corny physics professors, and that's what makes him cool, right? Um, so, and then we have, um, uh, you know, we have, um, my mind is completely, Leland, um, who actually is really interesting. They're both from Brooklyn, right? But he lives in Providence, and Leland has been really carrying the Providence jazz scene, um, you know, in a, in, a, in a way that I think is really important for the tradition here. And just, I just found out today that the one place that was playing jazz, like doing jazz, they closed it down, you know? That's whack. We got to change that. So anyway, it's good to have Leland up here on sax. So we're just going to play two songs. One song is something that Melvin and I did, uh, wrote together. Um, and they're oh, both 90% improvisational. But like, it's sort of to demonstrate what our previous speaker said, which is we're just going to get up here and try to play together and make mistakes. It's, at least I'm going to be the one to make mistakes. Um, so this is mainly, we hope you guys enjoy this.
Wow. Thank you, guys. That is a hard act to follow. Uh, but I do want to keep us moving along and uh, invite Charlie Cannon to come join us. Charlie, as I alluded to before, uh, I think in himself, just like Stefan, represents the interdisciplinary theme that you hear echoed throughout Panos and Stefan's and I think all of our remarks today. Uh, Charlie has deep expertise in a whole variety of fields, anthropology, architecture, industrial design, uh, innovation, entrepreneurship, and we're really thrilled to have Charlie here with us today. Charlie's the head of the industrial design department at RISD and uh, has contributed to my class, uh, the entrepreneurial process, and I'm going to let him describe a little bit about what he has in store for you because we're all in for um, a surprise and a treat. So thank you for being with us today, Charlie. So I, I think we have to give it up for those guys again. Uh, it's, it's not only a hard act to follow, I think it's kind of impossible. All, all the more so because, I mean, I didn't, you know, weird synchronicities. The bands that Melvin played with in the 80s and 90s are bands that I know and love. And so that was just a moment for me of like, Oh my God, what a Sunday. Um, as I get settled in, I'm going to also just say that, you know, what seems really super clear to me, in spite of all the crap that Danny said, um, we'll be seeing that later, um, was I feel a little bit. that better? I feel a little bit like my daughter who, who tried, a, um, tried out for a chorus last week and at the, at the audition everyone in the chorus had, everyone who was trying out was like, yep, I had this musical training, I had that musical training and my daughter said, I, I just sing in the car with my dad. And I'm feeling after this that like, I, I, don't even, I can't even claim that level of expertise. So I'm just going to talk about what I know, um, and, and I want to thank Danny and Butch and the Granoff Center for welcoming me. It's great to be back here. I was a fellow at the Granoff Center shortly after it opened and found my time here to be really incredibly valuable in my own development as a thinker and a creative and an and a interdisciplinary um, person. Um, but I'm, so I'm going to talk about what I know, and I'm hoping that there'll be something that's relevant and useful for you guys in that. Um, so I'm here to talk about design and design thinking uh, and, and to talk about them as sort of a, as design and design thinking as a kind of organized creativity, um, as a way of generating insight and converting opportunity, as a way of thinking about how to create value or in the way that Panos talked about it, creating futures. Um, and I, I feel especially good about being where I am in the lineup because You've gotten the kind of the full overview of what entrepreneurs are like and the lessons that they need to succeed. And an important reminder that creative processes and training and developing our intuition is super important to help us kind of see, make the kind of breakthroughs that designers are um, often lauded for making. But that those breakthroughs come from tuning and training your intuition through learning processes and sort of methods. And that's what I teach and that's what I'm uh, I think that's why Danny asked me to come. So, uh, as he said, I'm the head of the industrial design program at RISD, um, and I, I both run the program and I teach there, and, and there what I do is I use and think about how design can be used to think about complex problems, like the kind that business people or entrepreneurs or, I don't know, creatives or people in general, NGOs, organizations, nonprofits, cities, policymakers have to solve every day. Um, at the same time, I work a bunch. Uh, and so I, I bring these kinds of attitudes and thoughts and processes to work on Fortune 50 companies like Apple and American Express and to local organizations like, um, and manufacturers here in Rhode Island like Team Textiles and um, Hall Composites and Spars. Um, and I talk a lot about this stuff and think a lot about this stuff both at 
at design schools, but also at business schools around the world. So I teach at the Copenhagen Business School periodically, and I've spent some time at the Yale School of Management. Um, and I want to say that the that I went to a liberal arts school, so actually. I think the training you're getting here, for those of you who are brownies, is more valuable th in the long run and for your life in a creative life and a career than the kind of training that, I, that I, I'm trying to give to my students. Because I think being well-rounded and being able to think creatively and think critically is at the, at the kind of the core of what good liberal arts education is about. Um, so I want to say a few things about what design is now. Uh, and I'm going to use Apple as an illustration, even though we may, you know, want to work out a better way for artists and musicians to get paid. <laughs> Panos has been working on this for a while, so I think he's got something in the back pocket that he could talk about later. Um, and at RISD, and in general, and so this guy Tim Brown is the CEO of uh, probably the largest design consultancy in the world, IDEO. Um, Designers are now being asked not only to think about products, but services, processes, as he describes it, and I'll talk about it in terms of platforms and strategies. So as an industrial designer, I know that when I tell you I'm a designer and you think of what design is, most people see this. A sort of minimal, kind of extreme, perhaps well-designed, ideally well-crafted object that's part of your daily life that may or may not have affected it in some real and realistic way. But, now we're gonna escape now so we can go back over here. But I think one of the insights that Apple brings to that, that world and the thinking about design that way is that it's about the Part of what's like that one of the things that are before the design is good. disappears, it gets out of your way. We won't watch all of them, I promise. Um, though we could. But it, it disappears and it gets out of your way, and when it does, it is, as um, Stefan Sagmeister said uh, the other night in the Happy Film at the Providence Art and Design Film Festival, which you should all go to, um, it's like a pure direct line to happiness. For him, it was like music and the open road no cars on it, nowhere to go, pure happiness. That's just the, the evidence of a great, syst a great service or a great experience proposition. Apple's probably most successful because it's a platform company. Because what it's mastered and what it's figured out how to do is to build des and design systems that allow for this incredible integration so that for us, you know, we look at our watch, we look at our phone, we look at the computer, we see a lot of the same things, we're able to find the same music, we know where our images are. What they've done is they've constructed a system, they've designed a system that enables that to happen. And that's one of like what I would describe as the three kinds of design. So if we're counting backwards, platforms or systems, services and experiences, and then objects and artifacts. And then finally, it's about strategy and vision. Uh, and it's not here that I want to turn you all into Steve Jobs or t turn you into Steve Jobs lookalike. There's whole television programs that are devoted to skewing that, right? We've all seen it. Um, what Jobs did was that he wasn't really a designer in the way that we think about design. But he made a space to say, this is the where we want to be moving, and I want to design a way to get that. He was a kind of an organizational genius and a business genius who happened to have some kind of crazy ideas about what color the inside of the computer should be painted which made him lose his job the first time. But what's really profound is the way that he was able to think about those services, those systems, those objects, those experiences, and develop a company around them to deliver them. 
to make what he was describing as a kind of appliance um, for to, to move the computer from the back room to make it a kind of part of your daily life, to make it an appliance. Which for all of you is like completely, you know, like, yes, so? But for me, those first computers were coming out when I was just coming into high school, just leaving high school, that were affordable or not, but that were opening up a whole new world that is now a world that we just can't even think. My, my kids are like, <laughs> yeah, the phone was in the wall and the computer was at a university and what did you do for fun? So to better understand all of that, then we have to kind of figure out, and we want to talk about today with you, is like, so how do designers think? So to do that, I want to take a, a tour or a mental field trip. How many of you have been in this building before? How many of you have been in that room before? That one, the lobbies, or the living rooms, the recording studios, classrooms, offices, theaters, galleries. Okay, so uh, we hardly even need to move. I did this uh, a couple of weeks ago at the RISD Museum, and we act or the RISD Library, we had to walk around the building. So there's 70 of us, it would take forever. But this building is ingenious. This building is about creating exactly the kind of situations that you're sitting in today, not only at the scale of what's happening in a single room, but with the scale of what's happening in the entire building. It is, and I love, I'm laughing here because what, what my autocomplete does, which you can't see, is it keeps turning the Granoff Center into the Granola Center. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. I'm looking for the granola. Where's my granola? All right. Um, you know, what this building, the intention, which is so clearly described here in the section, which is so clearly described in our moment here, was about helping people see and understand what was happening in other disciplines, in other forms of creativity, in other parts of the building, and get them to allow themselves and to make it easier to be influenced by one another. So all of that intention, which is all program, right, which we think of as like, oh, so what should this building do for the university? The architects were like, oh, well, the only way to do that is actually is to break this building in half down the middle so that you can see into there, because otherwise we know, I don't know about you, my building, which is not designed for interdisciplinarity, which is not designed for creativity, it's an old furniture manufacturing place, I can't see what's happening on the other floors, I can't see what's happening in the other rooms, I can't see what's happening. So they thought about this, they said, okay, we'll split the section, we'll begin to make it possible for you to see and be influenced, and we'll build it right into the building. The entire shape of the building is devoted to fulfilling its program, to fulfill its highest ambition for what this building and what this facility and what the things that are happening could do for the school. I mean, I just think that's cool. And I'm a geek, so it's okay. But I think the other thing, and it's sort of most clearly shown here in this drawing by Diller Scafidio and Renfro, was that you were gonna be able to see rehearsals. I don't know what that is. <laughs> you know, computer labs, maker spaces, to really begin to understand and be influenced by the kinds of makers, the kinds of thinkers who are doing something that you don't do. They inscribed it into the very form of the building, but then they did something else. They recognized that, yeah, that's great, but this is still a glass wall. So I, I can't get their attention. I can't talk to them. I can't actually be influenced by them they can't hear me, they really can't, they're looking at each other and they're talking, or they're ignoring me down there. But they built in the, in the staircase then a place where everyone could come together and see each other, could wander through, had a living room, these insane pods um, on every level where you're kind of encouraged to stop because you're like this close and you're sitting down, you know, somebody's right there and it's like, oh, I guess we have to talk. <laughs> or it's so great, I, you know, I saw you in that other room and the thing that you were doing was super cool, can we talk about it? Or whatever might happen. But they built it uh, into every part of the public and the private parts of this building. And then they took it outside. I'm done. I had great music, great architecture, I'm all done. Um, so, but how did they do that? And how will you do that? So Herbert Simon, who is the driest of all philosophers of design or historians of science, describes design as 
or the work of the designers, designing a, devising a course of action that's aimed at changing an existing situation into a preferred one. Which is, I, I love, because it's so damn dry. It's so ridiculous. And it gives us all permission to realize that we must all be designers. Because anyone who brushed their teeth this morning planned for a preferred future. You're going to keep them. That's better. And, and in fact, that of the, of the things that designing is about, or the ways that designers think, planning is a fundamental piece of it. Um, planning is about thinking ahead, trying to understand what the options are being able to see possibilities or at least kind of foresee the ramifications of the things that you're about to do and do them in a planful way. It's also about drawing. Um, the way that des designers think, the way that designers think about those and explore those different preferred options is by drawing. And you can see Leonardo thinking about preferred options here. So he's trying to figure out, I don't know what, Archimedes, uh, Archimedes screws, he's trying to figure out how to move water. So, you know, on this side, as it goes up diagonally to the left, do you put the screw in the waterway and it just draws it up and it goes into a pool? Or do you have to, I don't know, somehow bring it up through these water wheels or is it drop, dropping down? Is that the best water wheel that has the big gears and, and the one inside is probably a pain in the ass to fix? Or could I do this, which is like I just get this one piece and I turn that around? Or should the whole thing be more like a, like a wishing, like a, a well? So he's trying simultaneously on the same sheet of paper, he's exploring like five different options to try to figure out what the hell is going on and what could really work. Design is drawing. The origin of the word, disegno, means to draw. In today's culture, design's also associated with prototyping. Um, you know, fail fast, fail often. Now the whole point of that, in spite of what um, Silicon Valley would tell us, and in spite of even what some of my alumni would tell us who are working all throughout the Bay Area, is not because you want to fail. And it's not because there's anything particularly useful about failing. It's about actually figuring out what works. And so you prototype things, you come up with lots of new options in order to try to work through what's going to work. And there's so many things you have to solve for as a designer that you've got to prototype a lot of things because in this example, and this is so this is Dyson, what we're seeing are four different prototypes. Uh, you know, over here it's the like, I don't know, it could be shaped kind of like this. Then I'm going to talk to an engineer to use that to try to figure out actually how big the things need to be and, and begin to start to blue foam model a prototype that's like, well, it's, it's getting close. I can see the parts. I'm pretty sure they might work. Mm, I'm going to put together that top piece, which is actually working like this, the vacuum cleaner that doesn't suck. I mean, that does suck, but really well. Um, and I'm going to make the rest of it kind of try to figure out how to fit everything else into it. And then I'm going to go to into production prototype, which I'm going to ship to whoever's going to manufacture the damn thing on the other side. Now, there's only four here. Dyson famously says, and I have no idea if we can believe him or not because I've never met him, he did a thousand. Okay, so he must be a designer because that's crazy. But he did a, if he did do a thousand, what he did a thousand of these prototypes to do was to figure out how to make the best, most valuable, most salient contribution to the world of vacuum cleaners, which is crazy. And in the end, it made him a multimillionaire. Maybe not so crazy after all. But for a designer, to think about it that way, I mean, the other piece there, right, is he's getting it right. He's trying to figure out with each piece, how should it be tuned? How am I thinking about the engineering? How am I thinking about the manufacturing? How am I thinking about the user? How am I thinking about what I want it to be? You can't do that in a single drawing. You can't do that in a single sketch. You can't do that like, oh, it came out of my mind. I'm done. I'm good. Because there's only one Einstein. And we're going to talk about him some more in a little bit. Um, so what's implied in all of that drawing and all of that prototyping is that design is also decision making. Uh, so the average American home apparently has 10,000 design decisions in it. And I'm shaking my head because this is not the average American home, right? This is like the creeping terror of um, the, the too large house with a super large foyer. But nevertheless, there's 10,000 different decisions in here that the designer had to make. 
And those decisions ranged from what should it look like on the outside? How big should it be? How should it be skinned? What is it like when you come inside? Do you feel welcome? Have you walked into this place where it's like, oh my god, there's people working down there. How am I going to get out of the building in a fire? Where's the heating and ventilation? What's the structure? How does it relate to the larger program? 10,000 decisions across this incredible array of registers. Right? It's like, it's insane. Um, and they have to be tightened up to be made into one thing. Right? Like a good piece of music, it's got to be the thing. Like Once you get done, the ideas don't matter, but you have to make all of those decisions. You have to work through all of those ideas in order to get someplace. Um, and, and I'll say that I think that's one of the things that distinguishes design from uh, problem-solving disciplines or other problem-solving disciplines, like law, like business, like medicine, like con some, well, let's say engineering. I won't, <laughs> I won't talk about science. Can't even sing in the chorus. Um, which are where we're trained to think analytically. Like we're trained to neck down complexity. We're trained to kind of try to figure out how to make things that are breaking it down to the least complex part and then figuring out what that is and solving for that. This decision making is asking you to think synthetically, to make more than the sum of the parts, not to figure out the smallest part of the parts. Which brings me to the process of design. Um, this is what design looks like. <laughs> Almost all designers agree with it. I think it's actually not a very realistic diagram because I've never seen that part like that. <laughs> uh, I don't think that's possibly true. But it is a process by which, as I was just saying, you're kind of at, we, d we add complexity at the beginning. We think more about all of the other pieces or larger contexts that need to be figured out or understood as a way of framing how we're going to even approach thinking about a problem. Um, and we'll talk more about this in a bit. The last distinguishing feature of design that I want to talk about is that it's a verb about people. Design is human-centered. I know this is like a really cheap uh, ploy to pull on the heartstrings of the audience, so I, I'm sorry. Um, but I think this is kind of an amazing thing, because one of the things that 3D printing is, ha is doing, and I think there are a lot of things it's not doing that we're saying that it does, but one of the things that it's doing is it's allowing people who can't afford, which is to say tons of the population of the world, including kids all over the United States, to figure out how to design and produce prosthetics open source that they can use and they can use how they want because it's and make them cool instead of like some dumb thing which doesn't quite look does not my skin color and it doesn't quite do what I want it to do it doesn't do what a hand does but it's trying to look like a hand maybe I can make it do some of the things I need it to do to be able to be alive in this world in the way that people with two hands can be alive designers are trained early on and always to be to try to figure out how to develop their empathy try to understand what people actually need, not to give them like the latest cool technology or the thing that we think is so brilliant, because when we do that, we usually fall on our face. We're trying to figure out how to create, identify real human need, and through inquiry, to discover how to create something of real and lasting and substantive value. All right, so that was design. Now there's this other thing out there right now called design thinking. Let's talk about that. Let's let somebody else talk about that. I make stuff up. Okay. <laughs> Look at what's happening now. There have been fundamental changes in the way uh, people think about problems, the kinds of problems that occur, and certainly the impact on design. Now, my definition of design thinking is applying the methodologies and approaches of design to a broader set of issues and problems in business and society. So many people think that it's kind of like in your genes. You're a creative person or you're not. I don't buy that. Prototyping, testing, failing all the time, but failing quickly and cheaply in order to succeed. A big part of it with city governments is just getting them comfortable with the idea of experimentation. It's totally antithetical to the culture of startups in Silicon Valley. Try something, if it doesn't work, throw it out and start again. 
Now, when the government came to us and asked us to redesign the ballot, we said we wouldn't redesign the ballot. But what we would do is redesign the election experience. If I didn't have to just pick a boring, ugly bike <laughs> pre-built off the shelf, if I got to choose the color of the frame, the color of the wheels, what would my bike look like? I think it was called the Flower Power was the internal name for one of the IMAX. And it wasn't a success. It lasted in the marketplace for six months. Some people are saying, oh, I hate the word design thinking. If you're only thinking, then you're not doing. Some of the aspects of design thinking are simply suggesting that designers are not thinking. It doesn't matter what the problem is, I can go in and solve it because I'm a designer. I once had a guy come to me and literally say, it ain't show art, kid. You know, it's show business. Why is it that big, huge corporations get beaten by kids in garages? So we'll end it. We'll end that there. Um, so the last speaker was Roger Martin, who used uh, Roger Martin, who used to be the dean of the Rotman School, and has done a lot to propel design thinking, and 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 the use of design processes and methodologies into the entrepreneurial space, into kind of consulting and strategy and innovation at large scale companies, along with the other folks we saw there um, from Jump Associates, for IDEO, David Kelly and Tim Brown, the guy with the crazy mustache. Um, uh, I make stuff up. Stop, stop, next one. Um, and so in, in some ways, and it's hot right now, and has been for a while, and in the first part of that trailer, you were seeing the reaction of designers who were like, whoa, designing is my thing, it's not your thing, so you can't call it design thinking because that means I'm not thinking, and that's mean. And then at the end of it was the other side, which was also equally valid, which was, I'm the designer, I can solve anything, was the innovation strat uh, strategist, uh, and, and frankly, most business people saying like, and a lot of NGOs rightly saying, okay, creativity is useful, but you kind of got to bring your whole brain to work if you're going to have really significant impact. Um, so, but I think what's interesting and what's useful for this conversation and in general what's I think a real contribution that design can make is thinking about how to use the design processes, design methodologies for thinking to think about things that are more than just projects, more than just products to begin to think about strategic vision, to begin to think about organizational management, to begin to think about really large scale social innovation problems or projects or questions. Um, how much time do I have left? Because I have my timer, but every time I hit a movie, it goes back to zero. All right. So. I'm gonna, so I'm gonna then, I'm gonna, we're actually gonna see a couple more slides which I was thinking about not using. But I, I think where this is coming from is something which most of you growing up today, most of you in this room will just recognize as kind of the existing conditions of our life. Um, which is to say that um, things are, wic are wicked complicated right now. And that in 2010 when IBM did their biannual global CEO study, they interviewed, I think, 1,500 CEOs, and the CEOs, like, as they say here, I think it was, I can't remember now if it's 83 or 67 percent, um, when asked, said, the most important trait for a leader in the 21st century is, is the ability to think creatively. So if design or design thinking is a way of organizing creativity or if creativity organized, the reason it's of value is because companies, countries, elections are seeing extraordinary increased volatility, right? There's incredible political volatility. This happens to be a picture of Bangladesh from earlier this year, but could just as easily be Venezuela or Syria or Ukraine. One, a, a period in which it's characterized by phenomenal economic volatility, by extraordinary and advancing ecological volatility, not to mention being in the midst of a period of rapid technological change. I wonder what we'll look like 100 years from now if Kurzweil's right about that. Um, changes that are undermining traditional businesses. To Panis's point, we could probably uh, apply that information, we could probably apply that intelligence, we could probably apply this to something smarter than calling a taxi. 
changes that are dramatically transforming and technologies that are transforming other businesses. I could talk about you know, manufacturing, but I could just as easily talk about the music business. Well, but changes that are also making it possible for new players to enter into the marketplace in a way that they've just never had access to before. It's easier to get Kickstarter money. It's easier to get venture capital. There are so many more avenues. There are so many more platforms that can allow you to begin to bring your ideas to an audience and to try to get traction with them. And ultimately, getting traction is about then being able to bring th realize them. And, and these CEOs and these companies are doing it because they realize they needed to stay competitive in a landscape where th things are coming from behind, right? Roger Martin ends that clip with, you know, why is it the kids in the garage are beating the, the, C the Fortune 500? Well, the, Fortune fi the parts of the Fortune 500 who are figuring it out, or in this case, sorry, the S&P 500, who are figuring it out and who are themselves investing in design capability are seeing a remarkable return that's their, that's their design, um, that's the difference, the alleged difference from the um, Design Management Institute as they compare the performance of these companies and their stock prices compared to the rest of the S&P 500. So they're seeing a return on these investments and they're going out of their way then to make it executive priority, creating design, design um, chief design officers and other design positions at, at senior level management levels. Okay, so I hate the word innovation, but so what does that have to do with why we are here didn't fit on one line and I'm a designer, so I, I couldn't stand it to go on a second line. So uh, I think what it has to do with innovation, I think what it has to do with entrepreneurship, I think what it has to do with creative creativity and finding ways to bring new value, new social value, new business value out into the world, into the marketplace, is that for the most part, as Bruce Nussbaum, who um, writes for Business Week and, and uh, a variety of other venues now, said earlier in this decade, that when people talk about innovation in this decade, what they really mean is design. And what he meant by that was the application of all those processes that I've described, and what he meant by that was the ways in which designers are thinking to figure out how to deliver new value to customers, or new value to citizens, or new value to clients, because that's the definition of innovation. This is Tim again. I think I took it right out of the video. Um, so, if I say, if I, if I stand with Nussbaum, if I stand with Tim Brown for the purposes of the rest of this afternoon, let's say the next 10 minutes, and say that design equals innovation, then I have to do one thing which seems like incredibly boring and tedious that I think is actually really important. Because what they descri what, what innovation is today is a whole lot of things. Um, this is uh, Larry Keeley from um, the founder of the Doblin Group and his, which is a strategy and innovation company, which is now part of uh, Monitor Networks, which is now part of Deloitte and Touche, which is just a, all reflective of this incredible shakeout in the design world where the small shops are being bought by massive organizations. Larry and his group identify these 10 landscapes of innovation, um, moving across what they call configuration, which is sort of internal or in-house stuff, offerings, which is where we think about design is as most of the time, and experiences, which by which he means something slightly different than what I did at the beginning, and walks out a whole bunch of examples. And I think that these are incredibly useful for folks who are thinking about entrepreneurship or thinking about change making, whether it's as social entrepreneurs or business entrepreneurs or musical entrepreneurs, because they point to all the places where you can, you can put in creative thinking, inject it into a business or a business model, and give yourself more leverage. So this is the incredibly tedious part. Uh, the so I want to walk through briefly those 10 landscapes, because I think they're really valuable. So in this case, the profit model, we're talking about Hilti, a power tool company, um, which rents contractors tools so that they never have downtime if a tool is lost or stolen. A whole new business model for a company that's 
thinks that they're about selling you super high cost, super high performance tools. Or uh, Procter and Gamble, um, through their which through their Connect and Develop program, actually said we. And Danny will talk can talk about the other side of this equation all day long, but you know said at one point like oh my God there's like thousands of people out there who are smarter than we are. How do we take advantage of them? Maybe if we ask them to give us ideas and come up with business arrangements between them, they can become our outside R&D lab, and we'll figure out how to move on from there. So working their network and building a new network. Um, or structural innovation, and while I can't quite stand the guy, Elon Musk I think is really interesting here because of the relationship between Tesla as a incredibly smart kind of car company to develop, to essentially develop a market for Solar City, his solar powered company, and suggests a way to think about structuring your assets to build something even better, which ultimately for all of us could mean were this idea to work, this business plan that he's got going, in decreased cost for renewable energy because of increased demand for it. Uh, process innovation, it's most famously the, you know, it's uh, happened with Toyota. It's, you see it in all the business press dating back to the 1980s about Kaizen. We can also talk about lean development models. As we move into product performance, it's impossible to imagine now, because you're all thumb typers, that this was like unheard of when BlackBerry came out and said, oh my God, we, we want a phone that people could type on. We don't know what they'll type exactly. And so we need to figure out a keyboard and it has to be a physical keyboard that's gonna work. The first BlackBerries came out and people were like, but an amazing thing, you know, kind of thinking about actual simple product innovation and invention that your competitors then might wanna copy. Or thinking about systems, in this case, how Scion lets uh, people begin to really choose and select and customize their cars in the buying process in a way that's uh, at least originally much more radical than uh, is currently possible. Um, the innovation around services. So um, this is a chef at Cisco working with potential clients at college campuses all across the country, helping them think about like, what are the best things that could happen in terms of the way that you use us or we use you? Um, thinking about new channel innovation, so how you create your offerings, how you share your offerings, and how you do that. This is Xiameter, <laughs> which is amazing because it used to be, once upon a time, that having a no-frills website that assumed the intelligence of your users was in a prime innovation, which is what Xiameter was. You could buy crazy things from Dow Corning. Or thinking about how you build your brand, as in Intel. Thinking about new ways to engage your customers by basically suggesting, like, help us figure out how to use this incredible thing we've developed. Um, in this case, touchable screens. Um, so I, I run through that litany in part because I think it's very easy for us to get caught up in the idea that that kind of creative thinking, musical thinking, design thinking, creative thinking, should be applied to one or another arena. But recognizing that the arenas are super broad and that there are lots of them is actually in the, like, the most value that we can deliver as designers and the most valuable ways that you can leverage a process and creative thinking is to apply it to every single part of your business, every single part of your organization, every single part of your mission or value. So how are you gonna do that? Well, I don't know. Um, let's do it really fast. Let's become designers right now. You guys with me? Okay. So remember, this is the hard part. This is the part that none of us are trained how to do. Coming from a liberal arts institution myself, I was not trained how to do the fuzzy front end. That's the easy part? Well, only if you're Einstein. Only if you're Einstein, because Einstein says, okay, I'm gonna spend 55 minutes on that first part, and I'm gonna spend five minutes on the other part. That's great. I'm not Einstein. You guys aren't Einstein. I mean, present company accepted. But we're not Einstein for the most of us. So before <laughs> Stefan played and showed his thing, I was, so essentially what Einstein is telling us is what's the balance between thinking about the problem and thinking about the solution? How do you go from one to the other? 
before he got up and spoke, I was going to say that Jean Leitka was at least on par with Einstein as like the smartest homo sapien because she tells us how to do what Einstein suggests that we do. Now I don't think I can say that anymore. So she's the, um, she's a, uh, blah, blah, blah. she teaches at the Darden Business School. She's a business professor, probably the most extraordinary writer on design and design thinking, like way better than the designers and way better than the business people. You should know her, she's like Einstein. And this is what she offers. That, that the part of that process, that fuzzy front end, you have to ask what is, what if, what wows, and what works. So what she's done, essentially, is given us the tools to do what I spend years teaching every designer that comes through the industrial design program at RISI to do, which is to stretch out your decision-making process. Stretch out the way that you're trying to understand what's going on. Stretch out what's at work and what's at play. Because we're all trained, and we all do it naturally. We say, I have a problem. I have to solve it. We jump from problem to solution immediately. Instead of trying to figure out what the actual nature of the problem is, in a deep way, what is, how we could think about it in a way that would allow us to solve for more things at once, my definition of innovation, what if, as an entrepreneur or a, a creative or somebody who's trying to sell, try to say, how am I going to get there? And who's going to buy? Who's going to get excited? Who's going to come with me to go there? What wows? And then, 10 minutes left? This is amazing. We're going to have so much time to talk afterwards. Um, and then, at the even before you get to the solution, try to figure out what works. Right, so essentially what she's doing is saying, you've got to frame the problem. What is and what if? You've got to figure out what's interesting and powerful and exciting or useful about the way that you understand the problem. What wows. And then frame the solution. So what wows and what works? How are you, what are you actually going to do when you try to get to that solution part? That's like 55 minutes in there, to go back to the Einstein quote at the beginning. So you can't tell anyone at RISD that I'm going to give you little certificates for being designers at the end of this next 10 minutes, because i got extra time, apparently. Um, I want to walk through that process with you using an example from history. Um, that, that I think helps illustrate or demonstrate just how crazy, or in the language of the business press, one of my least favorite presses, right? I mean, there's like, there's kindergarten books, there's business press, no insult intended, not too much. Then there's like, I don't know, pop fiction, then there's literature, right now then there's Colson Whitehead. So like in that range, we got to think about like really cool stuff. So if we're going to do that, what they say in the business press is, what's that big, hairy, audacious goal? So I'm going to talk about a big, hairy, audacious goal from our history. Um, and, and I'm imagining that, I don't know, how many people know what that is? Wow, that's almost as many people as know who Dizzy Gillespie is. <laughs> All right, so that's Sputnik. So Sputnik goes up into space, sent up by the Russians. The United States has a total meltdown. It's like, oh my god, they got, they got a satellite up there. They're so far ahead of us. We are screwed. We're dead. Communism is going to reign. Capitalism is dead. Democracy over. Socialism up. We're in huge trouble. And essentially because we had no idea how to do that. So a whole bunch of people in the Kennedy administration and all across the country start to ask, well, what would it take for us to be able to do that? What, kind of, what investments would we have to make in STEM education? What kind of investments would we have to make in technology? What kind of understanding would we have to develop to, be, to allow ourselves to do that? And they thought hard about it. And then they had to come up, then they started thinking if we imagine them, if we imagine that Gene Leitka was in the room, right? Einstein's in the room saying, you guys, you got to think hard and long. Gene Leitka's in the room and she says, great. So you thought of the what is, you thought of the what if, 
but how are you going to sell people on revolutionizing science education in the United States? Just imagine her in the room. It's like Zelig. So what wows? So, so this is what Kennedy thought. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. But we shall send to the moon 240,000 miles away from the control station in Houston, a giant rocket more than 300 feet tall, the length of this football field, made of new metal alloys, some of which have not yet been invented, capable of standing heat and stresses, several times more than have ever been experienced, fitted together with a precision better than the finest watch, carrying all the equipment needed for propulsion, guidance, control, communications, food, and survival, on an untried mission to an unknown celestial body and then return it safely to Earth, re-entering the atmosphere at speeds of over 25,000 miles per hour, causing heat about half that on the temperature of the sun, almost as hot as it is here today, and do all this, and do all this and do it right, and do it first before this decade is out, then we must be bold. Okay, so there's some interesting things to note there rhetorically. Because that goal is big enough to organize and measure our efforts, and it's a goal that we want to win and we cannot lose. So Kennedy's version of what wows in my retelling, my completely revisionist tel retelling of history, right, is we're going we're gonna to do the moonshot it's going to be awesome. It's going to require an incredible investment. We're going to do this because it's super exciting. Oh, and then by the way, we're going to completely revolutionize STEM education. We're going to make us a national power again, an international power. And, and we're going to take care of the essential problem that we seem to be falling behind in the way that we else uh, 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 educate scientists and engineers and mathematicians. It's like the most beautiful bit of misdirection ever on the one hand and also like a total genius of like what's the really incredible thing that we can do that will inspire us, that will give us purpose and that will organize our work. There's this great and, and I think it's an urban legend story of Lyndon Johnson going to NASA um, a few years later um, after Kennedy is killed and running into a janitor in the hallway and saying, and, and you sir, what do you do here? And the janitor saying, well, I'm sending a man to the moon, Mr. President. I, mean, I think the, we cannot, while I have maybe underplayed it here, the importance of that galvanizing vision, of that exciting purpose, of that reason to get up in the morning and go to work is fundamentally important in helping to frame that problem and frame the way that you want to solve it. <laughs> the other thing that's really amazing about that is that NASA had no idea he was going to say this. So he's at some stupid t football game in Texas saying, we're going to do all of these things. And you can imagine on Monday, the NASA administrator saying, Mr. President, um, you know, all those things you said we were going to do that we didn't have the technology for, that we don't have the materials for, that we don't know how we're going to do, you know that's true, don't you? We have no freaking idea how we're going to do this. We're, we haven't even tried sending a monkey up into space yet. Like, this is extraordinary and kind of scary. And you gave us a time limit. And they did it. 
at the cost of millions and billions of dollars, multiple uh, campaigns, multiple rocket ships going to up into space, a number of fatalities. It's an extraordinary kind of bit of work, right? To imagine the, from the whole end of like, okay, so if we have to frame the solution of how we're going to get there, we have to figure out what real interstellar, well, at least, I don't know, to the moon, rocketry is going to have to start to look like. This is what design thinking and design creativity, I would argue, creative thinking, and I will I will, you know, be happy to join the music thinking bandwagon or to at least pitch my bag onto the side of it as much as, I, as much as the cool people let me play. I mean, this is it, right? This is what we do. This is the best thing that we can do, which is to think more broadly, to get to solutions that are going to deliver more value, that are going to inspire us and move us. Whether those solutions are for countries, whether those solutions are for companies, or whether those solutions are what do we need to do in our communities. Um, so there were too many people to actually do that today. So I want to leave you with like a couple of tools and a couple of little caveats about those tools, about how to ask those questions in the way that Gene Leitka just suggested that you could. So the what is, you should do a mind map. You should write down everything you can possibly think of. You should go talk to every expert in the field that you can think of. You can talk to everybody who's working in adjacent fields. You should. I don't know, apparently you need to listen to jazz while you're working on your physics and you need to do your physics while you're listening to jazz so that you can begin to see the broadest context uh, that you're working in. Not because you're going to work in that whole context, but because it's going to help inform where you're going to look and how you're going to think about and understand the solution set that you might be trying to build. So you're going to ask the what if question. <laughs> you got to use those really... Um, that really poor adhesive on that colored paper sold by 3M. This which is an innovation, actually, right? You know, so those, that the adhesive on the back of Post-it notes was in, G in 3M's labs for years because they couldn't figure out what to do with it because the guy who was trying to make it was trying to make something that would stick so hard you could never get it off. The thing I don't want you to do when you use these Post-it notes and that when you brainstorm with, with people and you brainstorm around what those possible solutions are, is don't think that you're done. Don't do what the kids at the Yale School of Management said to me when I came to visit them and talk about design thinking, which is, we got this. We've done that, that thing, that post, that, that thing. We know how to use those colored pieces of paper. We understand it. It's like brainstorming is just the beginning, but brainstorming, being able to see a bunch of options, and if you look at the most recent literature around brainstorming, doing it in bouts so that you do some, you look at it, you critique it, you look, talk to each other, you let each other critique each other, and then you keep going. That's the way to do it. You don't just throw everything up on the wall. Well, you do, but you refine it. Uh, what wows? I like thinking about the future. Uh, <laughs> I like imagining, if anyone asked what that was going to look like, before they sent anyone up there. Then, what works? Well, I think the really important thing to realize here is that there's not any one thing that works. Panos talked about being flexible, about understanding that the, <laughs> the, I won't go to the military analogy, but let's go to the economic analogy. Every five-year plan is as good as the first five days. You need to have a plan so that you can understand how to organize resources and try to understand where they are, but you need to be flexible. And to do that, you need to think about the toolbox that you're bringing. I don't even bring this toolbox to work. Or you need to think about the work as a portfolio. Like, what are the things that you're going to try to do to get you there? So what are the, you know, what's the part of your portfolio like an investment portfolio, but it's like this is a different kind of risk portfolio that's going to keep you there, that's going to allow you to expand, and that's going to have long-term benefit? Or maybe you need to think about it in terms of those 10 landscapes. However you think about it, you want to make sure that you give yourself multiple ways to, to success. And I'm done. I just saw the piece of paper go up. Bingo. Now 
I get to introduce Danny Warshe, who is not only a bon vivant and a dashing man about town, but like super successful and smart about this stuff too. Wow, that was great. Thanks. Okay, I see that people are reaching for some refreshments, and in the interest of making sure we end on time, I'm going to move right along, and you're welcome to grab some coffee or fruit or whatever and meet us back here. I don't know how much you know about me, so I, th I see some former students here. Very happy to see David and a few others. Uh, but I thought I might take the first couple minutes to introduce myself in the context of uh, what I do professionally and what I do entrepreneurially. The word that most people use when they describe me professionally, and most people don't use bon vivant, although I appreciate uh, <laughs> Charlie's uh, use of that phrase. Uh, but most people use the word entrepreneurship, and I think they do for a variety of reasons. One is that I've done it, and that means that I have experience starting things, building them up, and then harvesting them. In fact, the first startup that I was part of was one that I helped to start when I was in the shoes that most of you are in right now as students. I went to Brown. As you'll see, I was a history concentrator. And I fell into this opportunity to start a software company. And uh, that was a very Brown thing in the way that I think we're even illustrating today, that a history concentrator would be uh, lured into this opportunity to start a software company. And we built that company up, and over the course of a few years, we sold it to Apple. And that was a really great experience for all sorts of reasons, not the least of which was that it taught me what this word entrepreneurship really is. And then for most of my career, I've been involved in a number of successful startups. Happy to talk more about those offline. The other is that I teach it. So I teach entrepreneurship, as some of you know. Some of you are my students here at Brown. Uh, I'm on the faculty at Tel Aviv University's MBA program where I teach in the summer. And as you heard, uh, I was recently appointed to be the executive director of the new Nelson Center for Entrepreneurship. I coach it, which means that I work with a portfolio of startup companies uh, all over the world, as it turns out, including uh, Your Heaven, which is just around the corner, but also ones that are in Slovenia and Israel and other places. And I workshop it, which means that I do this kind of thing in all sorts of countries, in some cases, countries that I had to find on a map. I didn't know where Slovenia was before I went there. Uh, I didn't know where Bahrain was before the US Embassy in Bahrain reached out to me and said, we'd love for you to come here and lead a series of workshops because there's no tradition of entrepreneurship in Bahrain. They're running out of oil, and they need something else to rely on for economic development. And that was, I first found it on a map, and then I flew there, and that was a really rewarding experience. In some cases, I'm working in Israel and Palestine with Israelis and Palestinians, sometimes separately, sometimes together. I work with a group some of you may have heard of called Seeds of Peace. And I, uh, I work with them in uh, Israel and Palestine, together in Israel and Palestine, uh, in Jordan, and with a group of 
uh, Seeds of Peace Fellows in London, where I'll be going again in about um, a week. So sometimes the mission for the entrepreneurship that I teach is nothing to do with business. And that could be something that's on your mind as well. Uh, you may be here not because you're interested per se in business, and that's the footprint uh, that the Entrepreneurship Center is trying to achieve, which is very broad. As I said before, our mission is making entrepreneurship an essential part of the Brown experience. And so it could relate to theoretical physics, it could relate to public health, which is um, a workshop we led on Friday, it could relate to music and the arts, which is today, uh, it could relate to brain science, which is a workshop we're leading tomorrow, uh, and it can relate to every aspect of the Brown ecosystem. So that's a, a little bit of the lens through which we're seeing the imprint of what we're doing through the center. And I have experience doing that around the world. I went to Brown, class of 87. Um, I have an MBA from Harvard Business School, so uh, I do have a little bit of business training. And I point out P&G brand management because you'll see some examples from my P&G experience echoed through the short presentation I'm going to share with you. FRSA, anybody know what FRSA stands for? FRSA means that I'm a fellow of the Royal Society of the Arts. Now, I didn't even know what that meant until last year that they reached out to me to ask them to be part of that. And all they said to me at first was that Benjamin Franklin had, be, had been the head of the RSA in the 1700s. And I thought, okay, you got me. I, I don't even know what it is, although what it is, and it's relevant for today's discussion, is it's a group that advocates arts throughout the world and through all different kinds of contexts. Their headquarters are in London, and uh, if you're interested in learning more about that, I'm happy to chat with you about that. Now, some of you, because you know what I teach, know that my view of entrepreneurship, and frankly the methodology that we're espousing and sharing through the Center of Entrepreneurship, is entrepreneurship as a process. In fact, the name of my course, the name of the workshops that I lead all over the world is the entrepreneurial process. And sometimes that's surprising to people. And it's often surprising because people say, well, isn't entrepreneurship just about an entrepreneurial spirit? And I have to scratch my head, and I'm not really sure what they mean by that, but when I think about it, 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 it sounds a little bit like voodoo. I'm not really sure what entrepreneurial spirit is. And in fact, if I'm charged with teaching it, and I know Panos, you posed rhetorically, is it even possible to teach it? I hope it is, otherwise we wouldn't be uh, gainfully employed. But uh, it's not about a spirit. In the way that I teach it, it's about a deliberate process. And I always remind people that at least at Brown, my teaching of entrepreneurship has traditionally been through the uh, engineering school. And I always think that if we were to teach somebody how to build a bridge, we wouldn't say, just go out and have the bridge building spirit. You know, just throw up a bridge, and if it happens to hold up the cars and the trucks, terrific. And if it doesn't, it'll crash down. But, you know, be persistent and try again. And uh, obviously, that would be insane. Uh, we would lose our accreditation. Nobody would learn how to build a bridge in a, meth in a methodological way. And I think about it as similar insanity if we're going to teach anybody about entrepreneurship to think about it as a spirit instead of a process. And so we don't have a, a long time this afternoon to delve into it. If you're interested, you can certainly participate in more uh, events through the center. You could take my course. Uh, but fundamentally, the way that I think about this process is that it's a methodology about solving problems. And if you think about that as what entrepreneurship is, then you can understand how that could relate to music and the arts, how it could relate to public health, how it could relate to brain science, how it could relate to the medical school, and all the different groups with whom we at the center are collaborating. And the three fundamental components of that process are finding and validating an unmet need, developing a value proposition, value that can address that need, and creating something that's sustainable about that model. And for today, in the short time we have in the next few minutes, I'm going to share with you some information about this first part of the process, finding and validating an unmet need. Now, sometimes when we think about where we might find an opportunity, whether it's in the arts or in science or any place, we might think that we're starved for opportunities, and yet Bill Salman, who's a guru at Harvard Business School, would say the opposite. He would say that 
opportunity is everywhere. And although that might be true, I actually don't find it terribly satisfying. In fact, I find it a little bit frustrating because although that might technically be the case, it doesn't really provide us any tools to use to go find and validate those opportunities. So instead, what I'm going to share with you in the next few minutes are a couple of tools for what you can use to start to find and validate opportunities. Now, when I talk to people and work with people in all different kinds of settings all over the world about entrepreneurship, and I ask them, how do you go about finding and validating ideas? What's the kind of research that you undertake to do that? Inevitably, people raise their hand and they tell me that they do some kind of research that I would call top-down research. And that's the kind of research that all of us at a place like Brown tend to be really good at. It's the kind of secondary prepackaged research that you would find if you went to Google. So for example, if you were looking to find and validate something related to, let's say, the pet food industry, you could probably go easily to Google or back in my day or Charlie's day, maybe Panos's day. Um, we, we would have gone into these big buildings on campus that were called libraries. And they would house, house these books and journals. And they would package some secondary research about things like how big is the market? Uh, how quickly might it be growing? What are some segments, like maybe within the pet food industry, dog, cat, equine? Uh, who are some potential customers? and maybe even some competitors. And usually when I ask people about the kind of research that they undertake to validate an idea, that's what they'll tell me. And although it's important information to dig into, it's by no means sufficient. And it's not even that useful, really, in terms of helping you to find an opportunity. So I'm going to share with you in the next few minutes a very different approach that I'm asked to share with people in all different corners of the world, among people doing all sorts of different kinds of things. It's an approach that I call bottom-up research or market-inspired entrepreneurship. And the good news is it's the kind of thing, and I, again, see some of my students, so you know this, um, that you can undertake tomorrow. It doesn't take a ton of sophistication. It doesn't take a lot of resources. It doesn't take any more training than what I'm going to provide you right now. And so I hope it's the kind of thing that you can walk away from this workshop with and say, wow, that was super valuable and I can't wait to do it. Now, let me share with you a little bit about what I mean by bottom-up research. And what I really mean is it's an approach to finding and validating unmet needs. And in fact, it's not only about any kind of need. In particular, I emphasize these two kinds of needs, strong and enduring needs. Now, why, not, why do I say strong needs or enduring needs? Why do you think? Like, why not weak and whimsical? Wh wh why strong and enduring? Let's start with strong. Why do you think I say a strong need? Why is a strong need important? Yeah. Right. So nobody's going to take action to address a need if it's a weak need, there's more likelihood that they'll address it if it's something that's a strong need, yeah? Yeah, good. Um, what, and actually the adage that sometimes I use that I borrowed from a venture capital friend of mine is he's looking f to back a venture that has a need like hair on fire. Because if your hair's on fire, then you're going to be very motivated to find a bucket of water to put it out. Yeah, so it's kind of encapsulating your uh, point there, yes? And then why enduring? Why not faddish or whimsical? Why is it better to find an enduring need? Yeah, so we talked about that third component in the process of sustainability. So better to address a need that's got a long time horizon because that would mean the effort you're putting in to address it will yield benefits for a long time, not a short time, yes. Now, one way that I shorthand the description of what I mean by bottom-up research is to be an anthropologist. Now, how many of you have taken an anthropology course? A number of you. Have any of you taken an anthropology course with Lena Frusetti? Lena Frusetti is a world-class anthropologist at Brown who I had the privilege of teaching with in Portugal a few summers back. Wonderfully smart anthropologist. And one thing she taught me is that anthropologists are great at doing this kind of bottom-up research. 
because anthropologists are really good at observing people and listening to people in their own habitats without intervening in a way that will change their behavior. That's fundamentally what anthropologists are really good at. And so a shorthand way to describe what I mean by bottom-up research is that, to be an anthropologist, to observe and to listen to people in their own habitats without altering or changing their behavior. Now, the other word that I often use for this is empathy or empathize. What do we mean by empathy? What's a shorthand way of describing empathy or empathizing? In fact, sometimes there's some um, metaphors that we use to put, putting yourself in someone else's shoes. Was, Heidi, was that on your... Putting yourself in someone else's shoes. Now, that's often a way, at least in Western countries, we think about describing empathy. Now, Heidi, I didn't hear you say um, judging somebody else's shoes, right? I didn't hear you say, uh, boy, those are so 2010 shoes. Or um, those colored, the colors on those shoes just don't match your sweater. Uh, or have I got a much better pair of shoes to sell you uh, I don't particularly like yours. That's not what I heard you say, right? All I heard you say was putting yourself in someone else's shoes. So perhaps it's a shorthand metaphorical way of saying, I feel what you're feeling. I can identify with what you're feeling. Not necessarily that I agree with it or I disagree with it, simply that I can understand it. Now, sometimes there's other metaphors that people use in different cultures and different countries. And uh, the other day I was teaching a group of Japanese faculty members who were here on campus, and they told me that the metaphor they use in Japan to describe empathy is something different. Synchronizing your hearts is what they said to me. I thought, wow, that's such a great way of describing empathy, and so I said I'll share it with um, the students that I encounter. So we all have a sense of what empathy is, we're not all necessarily programmed well to uh, achieve it. But empathy is one of the shorthand ways I describe um, doing bottom-up research. And again, what I said in the anthropological example is bottom-up research is really about observing and listening to people behave naturally in their own normal habitats. Now, here's a few things that it's not. First of all, it's not pitching. It's simply observing and listening. It is not pitching a new pair of shoes. It's simply observing and listening to understand what it's like to be in your pair of shoes. Now, this caveat is often very difficult for all of us who consider ourselves entrepreneurs. Why do you think that is? Why is it so hard to resist the temptation to pitch? Yeah. Yeah. Right, you believe in your idea. You're an entrepreneur who wants to change the world. And all the more power to you, except now. At this stage, when we're talking about simply understanding the problem, now's not the best time to go out and pitch. But again, I, I myself have a hard time with that discipline because I consider myself an entrepreneur. And yeah, I have an opportunity that I want to go push to the world, but you have to resist that temptation at this stage. The other is, I'm not talking about surveys or focus groups. And sometimes I hear from people who say, wow, I loved what you said about bottom-up research. I went right out and I did a survey monkey. And I scratch my head and I think, that's not what we're talking about. Surveys and focus groups are contrived. They're not a normal way of anthropologically interacting with people in their own habitats. And this may surprise some of you. I'm also explicitly not talking about feedback. And I'll get to why I mean that in, in the next uh, second. So I believe this so strongly that I added this slide this summer uh, when I was in Israel because I, I, I want to be really clear, not surveys. Surveys are a contrived way of interacting with people. Nobody lives their life filling out a survey. Nobody uh, conducts themselves naturally by filling out a piece of paper on an 8.5 by 11 survey. So avoid the temptation to think that you're doing bottom-up research empathetically by asking people to respond to questions in an unnatural way. And that extends to focus groups, too. Sometimes people think, oh, yeah, I, I do some of that bottom-up research. We did a bunch of focus groups. And again, I, I pause and I say, that is not a normal way of interacting with people. It's a contrived way of interacting with people. And you get, you know, a joker like this who's dominating the conversation. So 
don't think that a focus group is a normal way of conducting bottom-up research. And feedback itself is also not what we're talking about at this very early stage. And that sometimes surprises people. And the reason is, when you ask people for feedback early on, especially when it's too soon to get any direct feedback about whatever, whatever it is you're looking to push onto a market, usually we end up with two, ex two extremes, or one of two extremes. One extreme is whoever you ask for feedback from says, oh, I love it. And why do you think they would say that? They don't want to hurt your feelings, yeah. It doesn't really cost them anything to say, I love it. And so they don't want to hurt your feelings. It's just easier to say, I love it. So that kind of feedback is actually not that useful. And the other would be, I hate it. And that's not that useful either. And it's often what you'll get in an early, premature state of asking for feedback because it's just not ready for feedback. So I'm, I'm cautioning you against asking for any kind of explicit feedback because the kind of response you're going to get just won't be that useful. Now, sometimes I hear people's response to this to say, this so far sounds pretty easy. How hard is it to observe people in their own habitat? How hard is it to actually just listen to people conduct their life? And I want to share with you something that I think will demonstrate that observing is actually a little harder than you may think. Now, I'm going to show you a short video, and your charge is actually fairly straightforward. It's going to go by very quickly, and then you're going to see two teams of people tossing basketballs back and forth. And if you've seen this before, don't shout out the answer, because I want you to stay focused. One team's going to be wearing white shirts. The other team's going to be wearing uh, dark shirts. And all you have to do is count the number of passes that the people wearing white throw back and forth to each other, okay? It's gonna go by pretty quickly, so just stay focused on what your goal is. And we'll see what you come up with. This is a test of selective attention. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. How many passes did you count? The correct answer is 15 passes. But did you see the gorilla? <coughs> this video is from research. So I'm, I'm not going to uh, embarrass anybody by asking anyone in particular if you saw the gorilla, but I noticed some people did not see the gorilla. I'll admit that the first time I saw this video, I didn't see the gorilla. I thought it was absolutely a trick. How could that be? That all you're doing is looking at a screen of people passing basketballs back and forth, you're counting, and you don't see a gorilla walking right in front of your face. That's astounding, and yet, it's the experience that many of us will have if we're in a very focused way, in a very narrow way, observing people, but not being open to seeing things that we don't expect. Now, there was another example I want to share with you real quickly, which is a group of researchers at Harvard Medical School were asking board-certified radiologists to take a look at tissue samples, the, the kind of tissue samples they're used to seeing every day. And they, uh, they were asked to just comment on what they saw. This was the tissue sample. This is lung tissue that they're used to seeing. 83% of these board-certified radiologists missed this. I don't know why everything's a gorilla, but uh, again, astounding. These are experts in a field. They're used to seeing this every day. And 83% of them missed that gorilla. So observing sounds easy. 
but it's harder than you think. Now, funny that everybody's referencing Einstein and Charlie. This is the same quote from him. I won't read the quote again, but this is to, uh, to demonstrate and to underscore the importance of bottom-up research as a method of framing the question correctly. Einstein says that if you took the first 55 minutes to frame the question correctly, then it's much easier to answer. And that's really what bottom-up research is about. Don't rush into the solution before you're sure about what the problem is. Now, if you don't believe me, here are the top 20 reasons that startups fail. There's a lot of reasons. The top one, ignoring customers. Kind of astounding to think that the top reason that businesses fail is to, to ignore customers in a way that bottom-up research would enable you not to. The other, which is related, is no market need. So when I saw this data, I thought, wow, this is a perfect advertisement for doing bottom-up research. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to share with you. Now, I'm going to share with you three real quick examples that if you've been in my class, I'm told you will never forget. The first is P&G. Biggest brand at P&G is Tide. And at the time of this example, it had been around 30 years and came in a cardboard box as powdered Tide. And the brand team wanted to find out what did people think about this kind of packaging. And they did what I normally say is the litmus test for doing bottom-up research correctly, which is listening more than 80% of the time, talking less than 20% of the time. And they asked people, and by and large, people were satisfied with the way the packaging worked. But they did something smart. They asked people's permission to go into their houses and to behave anthropologically and observe people actually interacting with the product. So one woman who had given them permission and who had said she was fine with the product pulls the Tide box out of a bag, puts it on a counter, pulls open a drawer, pulls out a very sharp knife, and she stabs the side of the box. She starts boring a little hole and starts pouring the powder into a measuring cup. And the brand people who were observing were horrified. They had no idea why this crazy woman was stabbing the side of a Tide box. And she was confused. She said, this is the way I've been using your product for 30 years. I'm, I am fine with the way it works. I, I don't have a problem with it. And that insight eventually led to the development of Liquid Tide. Now, the point there is several. One, the Tide people had been doing this constantly for 30 years. Bottom-up research doesn't stop. Number two, the woman herself didn't know she had a problem. And if you relied only on what she told you, you wouldn't have known there was a problem. It required them to go in and observe her interacting with the product to understand that there really was a problem. It's not her responsibility to define the problem. And it's less her responsibility to define a solution. So be careful about what people tell you and focus more on the, what they actually show you. There was this, another example of P&G with Dawn dishwashing liquid, same kind of methodology. The team went into people's houses to observe, and they noticed that a significant number of Dawn dishwashing liquid users were using Dawn dishwashing liquid for a surprising purpose, to wash fruits and vegetables. Now, there's nothing on the label that says you should do that, but that insight eventually led to the development of a completely new brand called FIT, whose purpose is to wash fruits and vegetables. And to me, it's a great example of making sure you don't ignore the gorilla walking right in front of you. Because they could have dismissed it. Oh, those crazy people washing broccoli with Dawn dishwashing liquid and not paid attention to the equivalent of the gorilla. But they didn't. They said, oh, that's weird. That's unusual. That's worth noting. And that eventually led to the development of a completely new brand. Now, the last example in closing that I want to share with you comes right from one of my classes here at Brown. And it was a group of four guys who, and I say guys not to be sexist, you'll hear why it's, it's important to the story, four athletes in my class who were interested in doing something in the area of nutrition. And so I said, when they hit a little bit of an impasse, go to Whole Foods Market down on Waterman Street and do some more bottom-up research. Go in the nutrition aisle and just observe people. Maybe ask a few open-ended questions. And they saw that a decent number of women looked like this coming into that aisle. And they noticed that 
these women were pregnant, and uh, they were pulling off these packages of vitamins from the shelf that they learned were called prenatal vitamins. And they had never heard of a prenatal vitamin before, but they asked a few questions, and they learned by listening that these pregnant women needed to take these vitamins for the health of their baby, and they needed to do that early in their pregnancy or even just generally when they were sexually active before they were pregnant, and they hated the process of taking these. They described the process as exacerbating their nausea, making them constipated, difficult pills to swallow. Uh, it was embarrassing to tote these around and publicly broadcast that I'm pregnant or just sexually active looking to get pregnant. And these four guys who will never be a candidate for taking prenatal vitamins in my class developed a business plan, pitched it to investors, and they came up with a completely different way of delivering prenatal vitamins in the form of these nice, now patented powder packs that uh, deliver it conveniently, that don't taste bad, that don't make you nauseous, don't make you constipated. I put them in touch with a scientific advisory board and some product development people to get there. Now they've raised over five and a half million dollars. They've, they won the Rhode Island business plan, by the way, to, to get started. Uh, they've increased their revenue significantly through the years. Their headquarters is just right downtown Providence. They're selling in all sorts of places, and they're selling on par or better than all the leading brands involved in prenatal vitamins. And they've now done more bottom-up research to expand their line to focus on additional needs among, among the same uh, target market. Now, Dan Azis, who's the CEO, maybe some of you know him, is a poster child for the use of empathy and bottom-up research. And if you go to their website, this is what you see. We listened and we learned. And to me, it's such a great example of the illustration of empathy. Again, there's no way that Dan himself, as a consumer, would have known what it's like to take a prenatal vitamin, but he's unusually empathetic. And uh, I'll end with what ultimately is a good story, but when Dan was young, as a young teenager in Canada, he was a star hockey player, destined to be in the NHL. And one summer, he was wakeboarding behind a boat at a friend's lake house, and accidentally the, the rope got wrapped around his neck. And jerked him behind the boat, and he broke his neck. He ended up paralyzed face down in the water. And thankfully, somebody who was with him knew enough to write him, get him breathing again, and he had a miraculous, life-saving operation that had almost no side effects except for one. He had to have his neck fused in a way that made it difficult for him to turn his neck. He came to Brown, and he was still very athletic. And so he joined the one team that didn't require any kind of hard contact, and that was or even to move his neck, and that was he joined the uh, varsity crew team. Because you can imagine, all you have to do in, in a rowing crew is look straight ahead, you don't have to move your neck, and just row like hell. And so his team won the NCAA championship, and, uh, but in that experience, I think he developed an acute sense of empathy. I'm going to end by saying that even if you don't think of a way to interact with consumers in doing bottom-up research, there's other ways in which you can gain all sorts of useful information anthropologically and empathetically by interacting with other people all throughout your supply chain. So if you're an artist, if you're a musician, if you're a scientist, whatever kind of entrepreneur or aspiring entrepreneur you can be, I will leave you with the uh, encouragement to start by doing bottom-up research as a way of finding and validating an unmet need. It's the first part of this entrepreneurial process that is now the bedrock of what I teach at Brown and what the center is espousing and uh, expanding to all walks of the Brown ecosystem. So I really appreciate your attention. I'll be very happy to chat with you further about this, whether it's today or beyond. And uh, I'll leave you with this, which is if you're interested in anything to do with entrepreneurship at Brown, any of the events coming up, we have lots happening this month. It's uh, Entrepreneurship Month, including the screening of an amazing video on Thursday night um, called Generation Startup. I don't know if there's any seats left, but if you're interested, you can sign up with Liz. And uh, it's about the experience of several students through the Venture for America program. And if you're interested in anything else related to what we're doing, 
Uh, we would love to have your feedback, your insight, your suggestions. Definitely check out our Facebook page, which is the best place um, to find out what's going on at the center. Thanks very much for your attention today. Hello. Let's check the switch over. There we go. All right, so we're going to move into the next section of the program today, which is to show you some real on the ground examples here, things that are happening here at Brown product development actually in the realm of music. So we're developing new musical instruments. My name is Butch Ravan. As I said earlier, I'm the head of the Arts Initiative, which, uh, among other things, kind of runs this building. And uh, one of the things that we've done a lot with is actually work with arts and technology. And we have many courses we teach. I'm also the co-director of a program called MEME, which is a multimedia and electronic musical experiments at Brown. It's our com computer music and multimedia program. And this is a place where students can learn electronics, learn build to build musical instruments, learn how to play them. And this is kind of what you're going to hear about right now. So I'm going to give you an example of, of a venture I'm involved in, and then we'll kind of move into another venture that will feature Arvid St and Steve's uh, project as well. So this project that I'm going to talk about is based around an instrument which is sitting up, up here. I'll show you the real example a little bit later. I'll demo it. This is an instrument called the end dial. And so we have a venture we call Intelligent Instruments that's based around this. We have this idea this is a new paradigm in music making instruments that think, react, and play with you. So we're looking at a way of rethinking what a musical instrument is, and it's, an, it's something that actually plays with you that actually doesn't exactly just uh, behave predictably that actually has its own personality. Uh, and that's what we sort of built into this instrument called the end dial. Uh, who are we? I'm Butch Rovan. Uh, as I said, the other collaborator in this project is a guy named Peter Busigel. He is a uh, professor now at University of Virginia. He was a grad student here, and he went through our PhD in multimedia and, and electronic music here, and he graduated a couple years ago. And for his dissertation project, he actually developed the end dial in my graduate seminar. And this is an image of his uh, dissertation performance, which took place in this very room here. So this is in Studio One here in the Granoff Center. And this is Peter Busigel's uh, final project, which actually involved four of these instruments called the end dial, uh, sort of collaboratively working together. So where did this come from? Uh, I, I joined Brown in 2004. And one of the things that really kind of piqued my interest was this idea of new instrument design. I have to say that I didn't actually do this before I came to Brown. So coming to Brown, I kind of re completely reinvented my own research. I taught at Florida State University before, and I taught at the University of North Texas, which has like the biggest school of music in the country. We had 2,000 mu music students. Uh, I taught uh, and kind of directed a center for electronic music there. I came here, and I found sort of a, an interesting ecosystem of creative uh, Brown students who are also interested in the arts and technology and that fusion. And so that led me into thinking about okay, music and design thinking, how can we actually combine these? And so this is what I'm doing in my courses, is actually uh, develop a series of courses that enable this kind of development. Uh, in these courses, we find solutions through action. So that's actually an image of a student act building, this is sort of at the beginning of the course, a student is building a guitar fuzz box, reading a schematic and prototyping it. Uh, and these are people that come into the course with no background whatsoever in electronics. Uh, here's a actually a first year seminar with students learning electronics teach programming because there's a necessity to do some programming along with this, and this is an environment called Max MSP that we use f to develop these applications, and that's in fact what I'll be using a little bit later. Uh, and then we teach fabrication. So this is actually Peter building the first version of the end dial, uh, and that's uh, our nice, messy physical media lab, which is, you can't see, it's, it's actually exactly below us here in the building. It's an electronics lab for the arts. And that's one of the things that this building is actually giving the arts campus here is just a fantastic facility. So, and we also learn performance techniques. So that's actually an image of me performing with the instrument I developed called the globe, which is a sort of a translucent ball that creates sound and image based on how you rotate it and squeeze it. 
and I perform a lot with these instruments that I build as well. So I'm very actively engaged in this whole uh, world, and um, I totally find it fascinating. I'm also fascinated what the students will come up with. But maybe the first question is why? What is the context? Why, why would we want to do this? Well, I, mean, I should say, first of all, the why is just that it's really cool. We love loved to do this kind of stuff. But if you want to think about taking it in, into the entrepreneurial vein and actually making a business out of it, why would you want to do that? Uh, well, the context is that there is a huge industry built around this. So you could take these ideas from a musical instrument and kind of put it into larger context. The electronic musical instrument industry at least at that point, it was a $226 million a year business. It's huge. Actually, before I finished my PhD, I worked in Silicon Valley as a product manager for a very famous, at that point, but now defunct, uh, music company called Opcode Systems that made uh, hardware and software. And it, it, it's, it's amazing the, the sort of amount of possibilities in the music industry for combining arts and technology, making software and hardware devices is really amazing. But this is, a, this is the sort of the uh, place that, and this is the playing field that we were thinking about. Um, now, this particular device, the M-Dial, uh, it has a, a kind of a target is in the DG world. It has many applications, but it's definitely, definitely applicable to the DG world. And this is just showing the sort of increase in uh, sales, especially amongst DJ controllers, so devices that DJs use on stage to uh, remix. Um, it during the course of a performance. So this is a, a huge um, area of promise. Uh, now that we live in this world here with this sort of exponential uh, curve of technology and, and music combining all the way from the teleharmonium, if any of you have taken the intro to music and computers, you might remember that term. The vacuum tube, theremins, electric guitars, et cetera, et cetera, and here we are. What's the next thing? Well, um, this is the world we live in right now, which is a series of all sorts of kind of things called controllers. Uh, in fact, the course I teach is, is called Designing and Playing Alternate Controllers. Uh, we have grid controllers, keyboards, touch controllers, drum pads, touch screens, all sorts of things are possible here. Uh, but it's, there's a lot of possibility here. Um, I think this is where we see the end dial going. One of the things that's very cool is the trend is towards a sort of a retro analog sense, electronic dance music, integration of mobile media devices, phones and tablets. There's a real interest in things that are standalone that you can pick up that actually makes sound and you can play with. Uh, so moving away from the pure uh, laptop paradigm, w um, I'm sure you've seen plenty of laptop performers where it's just a laptop and there's a person on stage. There's a, there's a real interest in moving away from that where you actually see someone playing an instrument of some sort, and that's what we see the Endel as one of those options. And so people are describing this attraction to electronic music as the sort of 21st century guitar boom. Um, so our company vision is actually uh, to sort of think about what's wrong with the current situation. A lot of the controllers and devices are out there, they're basically just interfaces. They're a way to sort of capture your human gesture, translate it into computer, and you get a sound out. So it's a very much kind of a one-to-one -one situation. You hit a key, boom, you get a sound. Or hit a pad in your drum controller, hear a sound. We're very interested in sort of changing that paradigm so that the instrument is sort of an active collaborator, so that there's sort of a relationship or character with the instrument and, you know, I'm an actually a tenor player myself, in fact. Um, um, I play acoustic instruments in ensembles. I'm very much uh, engaged with the idea of collaborative improvisation. And I think that's what sort of drove me to this paradigm is that we're, we're you know, it's interested in creating electronic instruments that behave as collaborators. So that's what we're shooting for is this sort of idea of an instrument that can sort of react, do the unexpected, in fact. Instruments that might do something that you might not expect, play in different ways. Uh, and so the, they are collaborators. They will react with their own behavior. And there's this idea that the, the instrument maybe is something between an instrument and the game, that there's a notion of play involved with the instrument. Uh, and th this is sort of the world that we're thinking of developing instruments within. Uh, as you can think of it, sort of the character of an interface uh, is something that th sort of that's the frontier within we're which we're working. Uh, so if you think about a traditional musical instrument, it, you know, controller, you often have some kind of hardware which might take the form of buttons and things like that. And there's some kind of human gesture that interacts with that interface. Then that's going to typically go to a computer. The computer is going to think about it for a little bit and you're going to get some sound. So those are sort of the basic building blocks of an electronic musical instrument. Now, that relationship there between the interface and what comes out of it could take a lot of different forms. Uh, one of the forms is that you just press a button 
and you get what you expect to come out. And that's sort of the world that we're maybe working against. We, we think there are better ways to do it. But that's one way that you, you know, often see. You press a button and you'll get something you, that you expect. We're kind of interested in thinking of other kinds of relationships, something like a tug of war where the instrument is maybe not giving you what you want. It's sometimes responding, sometimes not responding. Maybe it's more like a juggling trade-off where the control is in one uh, realm, the instruments, and maybe other times the control is in your side of the uh, equation. So this is the kind of the relationship building with the instrument that we're interested in doing. I've written a number of articles about this concept. Uh, typically, I call them obstinate systems, systems that don't really react in the way that you expect them to. But then this character of uh, the interface sort of creates the interface as a character, so that actually the instrument be has a character of some sort. So some examples. Uh, this is what we're going to be looking at here um, in a second here. This is the end dial, and it kind of grew out of Peter Busigel's interest in combining a game with a term table. So this is a very famous game called Simon that had this repetitive light pattern that you had to sort of duplicate. And of course, we know what that is, is a term table. Those two things together ended up fusing into this thing called the end dial. And uh, so the idea, at least from our st uh, standpoint, is that it's a new mode of music making. The end dial speaks immediately to electronic music and digital DJ world, but it's just one of its potentials. Uh, in fact, we have incorporated into, which is I won't show today, but we have also a video sequencer. There was the idea that would also do the same thing for music, uh, do the same thing for video as it would for music. So there are lots of other opportunities with this uh, concept. I'm going to show you a video, actually, of Peter, since he can't be with us today. Peter's going to talk a little bit about his uh, sort of uh, inspiration for the endow, and then I'll sh actually show it to you after that. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Peter Busicle and I built the end dial about three years ago with Butch Roven, who's probably standing somewhere here right now. Hey Butch! Uh, so the end dial is a random sequencer. It, uh, it, it draws sounds from, it draws eight sounds from any audio file you give it uh, and maps it to these eight steps on the interface here. Um, and you never know what sounds you're going to get. So um, I might get a bit of vocals, I might get just a kick drum or a snare drum, and uh, you, you just kind of have to deal with whatever the instrument or whatever the system gives you. And my motivation for building a, a kind of confusing thing like this is to play in that space between uh, what is a game and what is a musical instrument. So the end is a bit like a game in that you have to explore it. You don't know what's happening, it has a kind of world on the, it gives you a sound world and you have to kind of move around within it to find patterns that you like. It's also like a musical instrument in that using the controls you can kind of steer the ship and, and, get, the, um, and get some of the sounds that you're looking for or, or find interesting patterns. So something that excites me about it is uh, it, it, it gives, it, produces results that you wouldn't get by kind of sitting and designing and thinking, oh, this is kind of the music I want to write. Uh, no, by playing with this, you can find patterns that you'd never come up with on your own. Um, so it's just, a, a, it, on one hand, it kind of is like a new mode of expression, the cyborg working with computer type thing. And on the other hand, it's just a new way of listening to your music. Uh, and I think that's a kind of a fun, uh, a, a fun affordance of working with computers and new technology. So yeah, uh, I think that's it. Um, if you have any questions for me, feel free to email me. Uh, my email is peterb at virginia.edu. Pretty easy. And yeah, have a nice day. Peter Busigo. Um, so the endow has been uh, featured in many places. In fact, uh, what's not mentioned up here is that it was a second place winner in the Guthman International Music uh, Instrument Competition. So the Guthman in International Music Competition is Something well known to us uh, here at Brown because we have another person in the audience who did very well there, Arvid, who you'll see in a second. Uh, I think you had one fourth place there, right? Yeah, that's amazing. So we've had incredible uh, success out of this sort of instrument design program here at Brown, uh, thanks to the creativity of our students. And so the end uh, ended up winning second place. It's also been featured, as it says here, in this thing called the Craters Project, kind of showcasing instruments of the future, things that are going to make a real impact in the music world. Uh, so where are we now? We have multiple prototypes of this uh, device. They've been played by many, many people in many performances. I think what's cool about our set of uh, demos today is that 
we are at an earlier stage than Arvid and Steve are, so it's kind of cool to see the progression. So we have a prototype which is uh, still very nicely handcrafted out of wood. Uh, it, it wouldn't be the way you would necessarily sell uh, an instrument like this, but this is where we are with our prototype stage. You'll see how far much further they are. Um, but it's still actually, it's gotten a lot of uh, interest, and I think what I'll do, how much time do I have, by the way? A few minutes, okay, so I'm going to show you real quickly the endow. All right, so check, is this working? Okay, switch to that, okay, thanks. So, um, so this takes a couple of minutes. So what you have here is a circular kind of arrangement that's, it's, it's, um, as Peter said, it's kind of a circular sequencer. Each one of these steps represents a sound, and then you have switches that can turn on the different steps of the sequencer. Before you turn all the steps on, is then what kind of the interesting thing with, with the end is that you can actually randomize it. So I'll actually add a, a random. should ex explain here is that what the end dial has done is taking a tune and actually chopped it up into pieces so it's basically a, like a live performance remix engine so it's taking the taking this tune slice it into pieces and then randomly assign them to the sequencer and then every time I shake it I get another random association of sound slices from the tune I can also select a, a completely different sound set by holding center button pressing one of the other buttons which is assigned to a sound bank shake it and I'll get that sound back.
All right, thank you so much. So that is the end dial. I think we probably need to move on into uh, Stephen Arvid's project, right? Let's go ahead. Tech. They'll be setting up over there while we start over here. Great. Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for taking uh, your Sunday out and for joining us. It is an absolute honor, and we are very excited to share our revolutionary technology with you all. It's been a long day, uh, so we've tried to make it short, but real fun. So uh, my name is Prachi Jain, and my background is in electrical engineering uh, and business development. I just graduated five months back from Brown University with a master's in innovation management and entrepreneurship. Steve and uh, Arvid here are also Brown alum with a major in music. So let's start with a quick audience poll. How many of us here have ever owned a musical instrument? Great, good for us. Uh, and how many of us about music? How many of us enjoy listening to acoustic music? Thank you. Exactly the point I was coming to. Despite the ubiquity of digital tech and electronics in the music industry these days, there lies an innate desire and liking towards acoustic music. Just a second. <laughs> yeah, we're technology. Computer. Are the mavens in the booth uh, sure that this is all on? Who's giving us a thumbs up when this goes in? I'm not sure what's up. Awesome, thank yeah. you. Um, so what exactly happened? What gave birth to this era of electronic music? One of the reasons why musicians shifted from uh, acoustic instruments to electrified instruments was because it was hard to make instrumental, uh, acoustic instruments loud enough to be played in front of larger audiences. The question is, how do musicians amplify or record their musical instruments today? What are the market options, the current options and technologies that are available to musicians? One most commonly used tool is microphones. Generally, there is a microphone in front of each instrument. 
during high-end studio recordings, there can be several microphones in front of just one instrument. Can you imagine not just the level of technicality, but the expense that goes behind it? It can cost a musician hundreds of dollars to, to get a top-notch recording um, in a studio with an engineer. The other commonly used uh, option is a pickup. What is a pickup? A pickup is a transducer that captures or senses mechanical vibrations in uh, mechanical vibrations from musical instruments, particularly string instruments, and converts that into an electrical inst uh, into an electrical signal. Uh, the pickup can be inside the inside the instrument or externally attached to an instrument. If it is if it does require post installation you can only hope that your baby instrument successfully undergoes the surgical process of drilling and screwing, that it survives the hands of your doctor technician without losing the tone that you so dearly loved. Which brings us to the point, what are the problems uh, of the current options? Why is there a need of a better alternative? Why is there a need of your heaven audio? Hi, I'm Steve. Uh, there are a lot of problems with microphones, as most of, seems like a lot of musicians in here, so you've probably experienced all of these. There's limited mobility. I'm sitting here playing or singing, and I want to uh, look at others while I'm doing that, but they're playing together, and all of a sudden, my voice disappears. Uh, I'm sitting here and playing a guitar, and there's a drummer right here, and there's a lot of drum sounds getting into the microphone. Uh, I can't move around. The worst of it all is feedback. And we were going to do a little Arvid as a setup, or I mean, I think probably all of these people know what feedback is. We had so many hands raised for people who play instruments that. So when the sound from the speaker gets into the microphone, you get this. No. Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Good, somebody helped us with some volume there. We need that to hear ourselves on stage when we're performing. If there is a drummer and amplified instruments, there's usually a speaker right in front of me, and that's pumping right at the guitar that I'm playing. On our website, there are a couple of uh, visuals that you can see of live performances where we sort of overcome that. Uh, the sound of a pickup is pretty awful. Um, you need an engineer to help with all of the problems that we had before, and while the pickups will get rid of a lot of those problems, it's a kind of a, it's a lifeless sound is my favorite name for it. Lifeless, mechanical, it's very flat sounding. All of the touch and dynamics and sense of the pluck of a string, for instance, is gone. It's just gone and you get this very even sound, which has its place in the musical world. Anytime you come up with a sound, as you, you can talk to a sampler person, any sound in the world sooner or later is going to be cool in some piece. But on the whole, a guitar to a pickup or a violin to a pickup uh, is very unsatisfying when you hear the real thing. Uh, as a student at Brown, I was a drummer, and I started to work on some things that would solve some of these problems. Yeah, I was, when I was a little kid, I was taking apart radio, so soldering guns were my friends. And I started building things, which eventually ended up being the close-up system that we're using. Um, it solves these problems for a variety of instruments, particularly string instruments, as are the ones that we're going to be showing you today. Uh, what we do that's different is we treat each instrument as its own universe. Uh, instead of making a microphone that's a great microphone and will work for this or that, we look at a violin. We record dozens or hundreds of violins, thousands of drums, actually, uh, when we first started. Um, and we started to really understand the acoustics of that instrument. And we build a system that's end-to-end, -end, sort of from the beginning part of whatever kind of transducer and attachment mechanism we build for the instrument to put it on it. And then into the close-up, which is the little box that you see working. Arvid's holding one up like a pack of cigarettes. Um, that whole system is designed for the universe of that instrument. We even take it a little step further, and once you get it yourself, you actually do some tweaking to it that makes the box understand what your violin sounds like rather than any violin. And when you're done, you get what is pretty much indistinguishable from the real thing um, without an amplifier. It's just the sound of your instrument. It's just louder. Um, we have a great team 
of folks. Danny Warshe is uh, our advisor. We've been fortunate to have him. I got to meet him because I was a TA for Barrett Hazeltine, and he introduced us. Um, we used to have pictures of these, but we have he, he's got us going with a great team. Arvid and I have been working together before we knew Danny, but Prachi Jane joined us, and Rebecca Lister is over there, and she's um, they're sort of spearheading how we move this forward as an entrepreneur group. Um, a lot of the talk I've heard here today is very much like what I've been doing all my life. I'm definitely a problem solver, and I see something, and I want to get something done that makes it better. Arvid's the same way. Um, and I think, oh yeah, so, so at the other end of our, our device, what comes out of it is any kind of signal that you need. It comes out with a, a nice, some of you will understand this, a balance line signal that you plug into any amplifier or any PA. Um, and it will also plug into a computer uh, with a USB port so you can record directly. Um, sort of takes care of the whole world for you. And, and uh, probably the most fun thing to do, though, is to hear it live. So I'll let Arvid start talking and show you how this all works. Hi, my name is Arvid. This is uh, Chris Monty, Armand Armin. Uh, our excellent uh, musician. Oh, here we go. We got an image again. No. So okay. sorry. Um, so this is the team. Oh yeah. There's. Should I? Where do we go? Uh, this was a slide I was supposed to talk ah. about. I guess I'll finish it. So, well, um, we did about a decade or so of research. We got five utility patents granted by the U.S. government and several overseas also. Um, I mentioned the sort of end-to-end -end system of this thing that it. Uh, focuses on a specific instrument's universe and takes you very much from the beginning, whatever kind of attachment we need to make to the input and out into the world and the computer world also. We also actually have somebody w working with us in Boston who's using it to do looping and electronic music. He uses a guitar, but it didn't really work very well for his acoustic because a feedback problems and because he couldn't get the sort of clean sound he was hoping for so in live performances he would use an electric but an electric guitar which is a wonderful thing is a different sound and there's a very rich sound palette of harmonics and things in acoustic instruments which are really great to work with if you're going to sit there and start filtering them and making all sorts of cool sounds out of them because you have a much kind of a richer palette of, of data to begin with um, so he's using that actually for electronic music um, some EDM I think he does also so as Steve mentioned, uh, close-up systems required a decade of deep research and product development. Uh, as I remember Charlie saying that design, design is people, design is decision making, and design is prototyping. Over the 10 years, we, uh, we prepared a lot of prototypes, we learned, we combined the different aspects of design, uh, music, entrepreneurship and technology development and integrated all of them and uh, and created prototype after prototype. Uh, I want to walk you through the different prototypes we have developed over years. So we started first uh, by developing uh, analog, uh, we first started developing close-up system for string instruments using a analog electronics. Um, but they were extremely difficult to build and design. During that time, there was a shift in the industry from electro analog electronics to digital signal processing. We used digital signal processing and, um, and created a better processor, and uh, we could do that. Uh, we could do that easily and, and, uh, and, and mass manufacture it. Um, but but that's, uh, but it still needed a sound engineer on stage, and we wanted to develop something uh, as, as a standalone product. For that standalone product, we, uh, we used even powerful processors and a bunch of algorithms and came up with the recent versions. We, we conducted, as Danny said, as, as Danny said, um, a lot of bottom-up research. We went and interacted with guitar centers, retailers, musicians. We observed their interaction with the products. We tested them in different scenarios, in concerts, in their uh, recording studios, and uh, made some design changes. 
and eventually came up with the re most recent version, um, that is this one. Um, we have about 35 early adopters, um, and they have a lots of they have a bunch of things to say, uh, and we wanted to share that with you guys. Our most recent cellist, who is from Germany, used our product and uh, said, so this is what they have to say. We wanted to show you guys the performance of close-up system. And hence, we have, uh, we have planned a short and fun demonstration. We have been joined to facilitate this by two incredible musicians. Armand Aroman and Chris Monty. Armand Aroman is a luthier and, uh, and a very celebrated violinist, and Chris Monty is an equally celebrated professional guitarist. All right. So let's start with some music. I want Ar Armand to play um, a little bit uh, just acoustically without any amplification. an idea. Yeah. All right. Awesome. So um, turn that back on. And now I'm going to slowly turn up the volume as he's playing of the uh, amplification. And what you should hear is that it's going to sound like, not like he's playing an amplified violin or that what you're used to hearing is as amplification coming out of a speaker, what it's gonna sound like is more like his instrument is just getting louder. And that's what we want, that's, what, that's the goal we're going for. Um, so, here we go. said technology um Turn the volume up slowly.
Now we're going to have them play together, um, first acoustically, and then I'm going to turn on the close-up systems that they each have. really loud there, it still had that sort of intimate sonic feel, like you're just listening to them playing the instruments, sitting around uh, in a living room or something. Um, so another thing that, uh, that the close-up system does that's really cool is that it gets this really good isolation that normally a mic wouldn't. Um, so I'm going to play you back what they just played. Um, I have to do a little mix here on the fly, but... Um, <laughs> So we just did a pretty nice recording right here in front of all of you. Um, and so the other part of that is I'm going to play that again, and uh, I'm going, let's say, um, we only wanted to hear one of them. that these things have really great musicians to work <laughs> with. So we're really thankful for that. And I think probably we have hit our time. So we are very thankful to get to show this to you. We have some sort of a website you can access later. Um, thanks very much. Um. Uh, just to end it, we, are, uh, we have a few interactive demonstrations, and if any of you want to experiment further or want to play around with it, uh, after the event, we are available there, and you guys can come and hit, up, hit us with any questions or if you want to try it out. Uh, also, our website is www.yourheaven.net, so if you guys have any, if you want to know further, check us out. Thank you. Yeah, we'll just say um, a few thank yous here. Okay, so, hello, check, test, test, is that working? Okay, I just said, so we are at the end of the day. I just want to thank everyone for coming here, and I also want to thank Danny for starting this fantastic collaboration. This is really great, and we'll be doing more of this. Uh, so let's actually give a hand to the performers again. I really appreciate everyone. <laughs> We
we were just going to point you to some resources if you want to go further with this uh, in the realm of musical instrument design. If any of you are interested in taking that up, uh, we have several courses that would lead you to these kinds of projects. There's a course named Music 1210, Introduction to Real-Time Systems, that I teach uh, every year. Uh, and that's sort of the introductory to the programming part. Again, that's Music 1210. Then there's Music 2220, which is the actual designing and playing alternate control. That's, that's the musical instrument building course. That's Music 2220. It's a graduate seminar, but it's always filled with undergrads as well. And I have to say, the undergrads are usually the best people in the class. Uh, and then there's also Visual Art uh, 1720, a class called Physical Computing that also covers this topic. And that's actually being taught right now in the lab below us here. That's uh, Visual Art 1720. And then we actually, last year, and now it's happening again for the second time, we are offering a music business course. So to, uh, be on the lookout if you're interested. Some of you might be in that course for all I know, but it's music, uh, sorry, music 1270, making in the music business. And that's a course we're hoping to offer every year now. So there's, those are some of the resources and the music and the arts that relate to this. Do you want to talk a little bit about yeah. more? First of all, I'll add my thanks to Butch. Uh, I think when we were starting to get to know each other about two years ago, as we started even to envision what a center for entrepreneurship might be. I'm not sure we quite envisioned this exactly, but what an amazing yeah, way to totally. kick off this whole initiative. Yeah. So <laughs> thank you certainly to the speakers, to the performers. Most of all, thank you to all of you. Yeah. Uh, there's lots of things we know you could spend your Sunday afternoons doing, and we're gonna uh, be looking to hear from all of you in a, dare I say it, bottom-up research way. Um, so that we can understand what it is we can be doing to serve you more and better. Uh, music is one of the elements of arts, technology, and entrepreneurship that we'll be focused on. Already I've heard from some of our performers and speakers that they're eager to do more. Uh, and so we do want to hear from you about what it is that we can do to serve you in, in that theme. Uh, in terms of the Entrepreneurship Center generally, I'll remind you our mission is making entrepreneurship an essential part of the Brown experience can't think of really a more exciting way of expressing that than arts, technology, and entrepreneurship. It's in the company of Friday doing something similar for the School of Public Health. Tomorrow, uh, a event I mentioned in conjunction with the Brown Institute for Brain Science and the equivalent school at Tel Aviv University. All this week, we have additional kinds of events with alumni coming back to campus to mentor and to meet with students, a woman named Deb Mills Schofield. Uh, Laura Thompson, who work, former student of mine who works at Google Ventures, and Hudson Gaines Ross will all be here on Thursday. And in the evening on Thursday, as I mentioned, we'll be premiering and uh, live streaming an event right after Generation Startup, which is a full-length feature film produced and directed by Cheryl Hauser, who's a, a Brown alumna. And so if you're interested in any of that, the best way to find out is to go to our Facebook page the Jonathan M. Nelson Center for Entrepreneurship, or just email us at entrepreneurship at brown.edu. All of you should have received already, by virtue of your registering for today, a snapshot of what's going on in the near term. And if you're not on that list because you didn't register today, that's totally fine. Just either let Liz know, who's in the back of the room, let me know, or email us at entrepreneurship at brown.edu, and we'll make sure you're kept apprised of what's going on. This one last thing I was going to add that we are looking to do another workshop that's related to the arts and entrepreneurship. Uh, just this last week I was in LA and met with some amazing Brown alums. There was the head of the William Morris Agency, Bob Gersh, who's the head of the uh, Gersh Agency, the top talent agencies, CEO of the Los Angeles Music Center, CEO of Atlantic Records, a lot of Brown alums that want to get involved and so we're looking to do a, a kind of a workshop based on arts management in the music and the entertainment industry. So that's something that will be coming up uh, soon, I hope. All right, so thanks again. Thanks for coming. Have a good rest of your Sunday.